So first we have our latest update for the new elementary school design and so we are sitting this way so that you can see the TVs uh, because we do have a presentation and we will after tonight post this on our website so that everyone can see what the latest design updates are for our new school. So um, just to give you an overview, if you remember these are all images that we covered in the past, uh, June 19th. We had a board work session where we went through the latest uh, design. There have been refinements that we've had to make, uh, the majority of those due to budget constraints, but also because of the input of the committee on this process at this point. But it should look very familiar. So, for example, this last image that we're going to show is the profile for the building, and you should see it still does look very similar to this uh, design and how the different wings of the building and the different levels of the building overlay each other, and, and really the profile of the building looks very similar but we're going to dig into all the images that you can see. So one of the things that we're excited about, and it's also special because we're in this space today, is the fact that we've created a brand for Germantown Schools. And so when you look at uh, the design for the new buildings, you see a lot of the features that we have in this Riverdale expansion carried over to our new building. So for example, the, the windows that you see and really how it engages to the environment. The use of uh, multiple types of settings and seating, uh, whether we're, this is the cafeteria that you can see in the upper right, uh, that's also our auditorium. Or whether we're looking at you know, the use of color in the hallways to really break it up. You'll see a lot of these features throughout the design. So I just want to highlight those before we hand it over to our friends from A2H. And then I think something that makes our district special as compared to other districts is the way that we engage uh, our community. And so if you remember, we do have a design review committee that's made up of Ms. Landers, one board member, nine staff members from the central office. We have three teachers and administration. We have five community me uh, members that are made up of parents and also people who are involved in the community. And they have had four meetings over a period of time. But just to highlight uh, how often that group has been meeting, um, and what they have been doing, you can go to our web page, and so you can see as this clicks it through. If you go to parent resources and then you click on committees, you can see all of the uh, different members of our committee. You can also see the minutes and everything that they've talked about and really how we wound up with uh, the building that we have now. But then also you can see what really guided this process. And we started with a community survey, and that's one of the things that we want to do in all of our projects is really engage all of our community and say, what do you want to see in the new school? What's realistic? What are the expectations that we have? So all this is on our, our web page that you can see again, and it really defines how we arrived at this new school building. So once again, it's parent resources. Uh, then you click on district committees. Once you click that, the design review committee, and it takes you through. But we have had four meetings, and this really started in February with the survey. Uh, we've had our application process February 20th. And like I said, we've had four meetings, and we also have weekly meetings to go through uh, all of our design features. And that leads us to today when we're really talking about uh, the latest design. Yes. Just a question on the committee. Did that that when you went through that, you did not that didn't include did that include A to H and the other experts that were in yes. the Okay. So those so they would have been part of the community members or No, the, so A to H is, is separate from that. So we That's have, right. So, yeah, yes. so so we even had more kind of people right. around the table to give that that's input correct. and have that expertise that would that could be drawn right. on, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So really what A to H and done a wonderful job of doing is they translate our wishes, our mm -hmm. vision, mm -hmm. and, and make it realistic in the in the design. We, we don't really design the building. We talk about what we want and they make it a reality. <laughs> so let's talk about some of those guiding principles. What are those things that we wanted to see in the committee? What did the survey tell us from the community? What has our committee told us that they wanted to see in the new school? First is first class amenities. And you talk about the use of materials that you see around you here, the use of um, glass, the use of metal, the use of stone, brick, it's a lot, a lot of different materials so that it's not the typical center block of building that we've seen historically uh, in Shelby County Schools. Second is, we had to design this with room to grow and we're going to talk about the room to grow that we have for this. And then of course the third feature that uh, we identify are the natural views that we have. Because this is set on such a beautiful piece of property that has really large trees, and David, Smith, can you help me out? What are the largest trees on that property? 43, 44? 72. 72 inch, huge. Beautiful trees. Trees. That oak is just yes. That, yeah. So there are lots of those yes. oaks on that property. So having glass and 
hallways uh, and windows and activity rooms and spaces that's important us so that you can see that so you'll see those uh, in this design process so let's talk first about room to grow I think there was some miscommunication or misunderstanding early on in this process because uh, the documents from the design review committee I think showed one story uh, plan this is a two-story building so I, I would like to highlight that this is a two-story building and it does have a lot of classroom space it will be the biggest school that we have uh, not counting the high school it is our biggest elementary school that we have as far as square footage and also what we can do um, I tell you we always use infographics so if you'll pass this down this is another infographic that really explains how big the school is and how what could it fit but even know that we could fit more students than that so let's talk about some of our impact on our construction grade so first let's look up the screen and then we'll come back to this uh, one sheeter so what are we building in this new school there are seven kindergarten classrooms and we talked about the two terms maximum capacity and then we also talk about optimum capacity which is really just two students off of what the, the state's maximum capacity that we can have per classroom so you can see at maximum capacity, we can fit 140 kindergartners in this new building. Uh, in first and third grade, uh, once again, it's the same ratio. We have 20 classrooms there, and at max capacity, we could have 400 students. At optimal capacity, we could have 360 students. And in the fourth through fifth grade, we have 11 classrooms that are designed. 275 students could fit at maximum capacity, 253 at optimum capacity. So what is our total? We have 38 total classrooms for our students, and that's not counting the max classrooms. These are strictly instructional spaces that we have, uh, which would have 850, room for 815 students at maximum capacity, 739 students at optimum. And understand, that's not the most students that we could fit in that new school. There are three activity rooms that we're going to see that we could use for construction. So let's say that construction at the elementary school band went off the charts in the city, that we could use those rooms for classroom space. Also, we could put uh, use the science and STEM lab for classroom space. So this school, school could easily go over 900 students uh, without having to push on parts and using the spaces as we have them designed. So, no, that's so we feel very comfortable with the number of students. The one sheeter that you have in front of you uh, really highlights the, the elementary school grade band and also our middle school grade band. So um, this isn't about the design, but this one sheeter shows you why we need the new school and what it does through our K through five band. So adding that new school onto uh, our books, essentially, we have room for 3,140 elementary school students at maximum capacity, 2,843 at optimum capacity. So you can see we have a range of 72 to 369 students at the elementary school grade band. So we are creating capacity for growth. We have room to grow in the school. And these are projected numbers that we, that we have here. Right now, if we open the school, we're talking about a school that could open easily with 500 students mm -hmm. if we just rezone our schools. Um, so this is something that we would be growing into over the next uh, several years. Mm -hmm. But we do predict that there is going to be an issue with uh, our grade bands at the middle school, and that's something that this board's going to have to address at a later time, not for this <laughs> purpose. But know that one of the things that we can look at, you can see at Riverdale, at K-5, 6-8, at Houston Middle School, there are still some large numbers of non-residents. And so we've talked about this before. One of the ways that we can grade room in our middle school band is by drastically changing our transfer policy as it is right now. And also uh, rezoning is another way that we can address uh, the middle school band issue. But that still, uh, we are going to be out of room in our middle school level, and that's going to be something that we have to address. But that's a one-sheeter that if you talk to people in the community, that will help yes. you explain Thank you for uh, the new this school. Is great. Uh, but it looks very similar to building capacity. So let's get back to our new school. And what are you going to see? So what are the exciting things that came out of the design review committee's work and really engaging uh, the city of Germantown? One is we know that fine arts is something that's special to our community. So we have three music and art rooms. Uh, there's a combination room that can be a music or art room, which is comparable to other schools. Uh, safety is important, so you'll see in the design a secured entrance, similar to what you came into here at the Riverdale expansion. Uh, there's a science and STEM lab uh, maker space that uh, is also very similar to what you'll see here on the, the Riverdale campus. There's a full-size gym that is the same gym here uh, at the Riverdale campus, which is a very large gym for an elementary school building. 
uh, and that's important for Parks and Rec because they can hold games there. You could do two smaller courts uh, that are running sideways in the gym, so there are options for Parks and Rec. And I think one of the special things that you'll see about this building are the three activity rooms, and that was present in our survey. So whether you're doing wet labs, small group instruction, grade level storage areas, PTA, PTO meetings, we're going to talk about these activity rooms that are really designed for a different function in the school. And of course there's a dining hall that can accommodate 250 students at a time at circular tables. So let's talk about the activity rooms which really came out of our survey work and our design work. One is the walls on both sides of uh, this classroom, or on two sides of the classroom, are glass walls. And so not only does it allow light to come into the building, into the hallways, which is different from our Shelby County buildings, just like this room right here, this cafeteria that we're in right now, there's a room that really engages you with the environment, with the surrounding outside. And with the, the views of the lake and with views of those huge trees, that's going to be something that's special. But then it's a place for small groups. So if we have a group of teachers or staff that want to uh, have students and they're performing RTI in this space, they want to pull a small group to really work on some skill deficits. Or if the uh, teachers in the grade level want to have their PLC meetings and meet in this space. Uh, that's something uh, that they can use this uh, common space for. And that was something that we saw throughout our surveys. Teacher storage, you can see it's got uh, storage in here uh, so that the grade level teachers can put uh, materials in there and there's never too much uh, storage in a new building. Then also, there are two sinks, so if they want to have an activity that's a wet lab or they want to paint, they want to do crafts in here, this is something that teachers could use this space for. If they want to bring in a speaker to talk to um, their students, they can come into this space because it provides a different uh, arrangement. It does have a teaching wall opposite of the sinks, so it does have Promethean board and more project room for projection so that we can have either an Apple TV or some type of technology in that space. And then of course our PTA PTOs are always looking for a place to meet in the school. So this could be a room that they could use uh, when the teachers aren't using it. So they can meet and they have, have their meetings there also. So with that, we are going to start walking through the design and we have our friends from A2H here with us. And so they're gonna go through step-by-step step the building. Um, and I'll highlight some things too as they're going through about uh, what has changed and what you've seen in the past and how you see these design features are going. I also have made, this is something else that I sent you electronically, but I'll give you a hard copy. This is a by the number, so if someone's asking, tell us about the new school, mm -hmm. what is it, what's a neat feature, what is it hold, what are you building for? This is a one sheeter that um, explains. Thank you. Okay, Thank you. the new elementary. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm Chris Herring. I'm one of the architects at A2H who's working on this project since schematic design. And I'm David Smith. I'm a civil engineer at A2H working on this project. And uh, you just jump right in? Yeah, if you'll, do, if you'll take care of this first image with the site. So let's, let's talk about the site a little bit. Um, this is the school district's brand new pop property that they now own, 38 acres of prime downtown real estate. Located on the east side of Forest Hill, Irene, about a quarter mile south of Poplar Point. Uh, it has an existing lake on it, and located just north of that existing lake is the tree I was mentioning earlier that is uh, 72 inches in diameter, a wonderfully uh, wonderful specimen of a field grown white oak tree. Also, located just south of the school building is, a, is his younger brother, it's a 64 inch. Right uh, by the bottom tree, edge, yeah. And we have uh, endeavored to keep that. it alive as yes. well. That's awesome. So we'll be so anchoring the west end of the school with some pretty nice tree specimens. Uh, one of the main tasks with the site design on this, because obviously we're working with a school, the necessary parking, the, the amenities outside, but uh, we can't uh, drop 200 cars on the side of Forest Hill Irene as parents wait to pick up their children. So one of the main features was uh, determining a method for stacking uh, parents that are waiting to pick up their children on property rather than on city streets. And, and, we, we, and this is a substantial cost. And, and this is have an this additional cost mm -hmm. to the school district to be able to pull this off because we're adding a lot more pavement. Uh, that's been one of our 
governing questions as we do the site design and go back and forth with it of, okay, but if we change this, how does that affect our ability to hold parents on the site? Because that's something that the city has said from day one that was a concern of theirs and have repeated at uh, all the, the major meetings through the planning process. So we've come up with a way where we believe we can hold about 160 or so cars on site uh, just sitting there waiting for school to let out. Uh, Which compares to? Well, at Riverdale you can hold about six, yeah. maybe eight. Uh, <laughs> so 160 is greater than six. Yes. Uh, at uh, Farmington it's about 20. Mm -hmm. And at Dogwood it's about 15 to 20 as mm -hmm. well. Uh, so those other 150 cars that are sitting on the city streets waiting, we're holding on property rather than holding on public street. Uh, the, the site is a fairly level site, so we had some flexibility with how we were doing things. It allows us to have multiple drop-off pickup locations uh, for school buses, um, daycare vans, and for uh, children who have special needs. We have a drop-off on the west side of the classrooms. That's that western loop that winds in between the trees. If you can see the mouse on the screen, it's that circle right there. That would be your bus loop mm -hmm. and special mm -hmm. needs drop off there. Um, just so you can see the, the traffic pattern, you would have to enter from the south. Mm -hmm. And so we would have one entry and then you follow that course all the way around the whole parking lot, then up to the top where you're hitting the school. Mm -hmm. And we can actually do, uh, and I'll point on her so y'all can see too, we can actually stack, once we get to this point, two rows of cars so we can let one row of cars right. go at a time right. if so we need to. Yes. Down here, yeah. So if okay. we need to, we can stack two rows of cars here. Mm -hmm. Then you would have an automatic right entrance the mm -hmm. same way that we do with Houston Middle School mm -hmm. so that traffic doesn't stop. Mm -hmm. Once you drop off, we can flow. And if you Keep think going. about at Houston Middle School, we can hold about 70 cars. This is uh, more than twice that. Up, yeah. And then they would all flow at once. Uh, we have really taken into account the number of cars that we could stack on this to get them off of uh, Forest Till Irene. If we get in a pickle, um, this upper drive that we've talked about right here is for, to serve the projected central office uh, space. We could, and this is something that we talked about with city, uh, come up with a way to stack cars there because we don't know how the road is going to develop at this time. Uh, that would be right. a short-term solution right. uh, to a long-term mission. But know that this is our pre preferred plan and then uh, in and out right here, and I have one crossing guard right here, another crossing guard for school buses and special needs parents to come in and drop off their children. The, the number of students that would uh, be brought in through this northern entrance for buses, vans, special needs would be about a third of the school population. Okay. So the other two thirds of the school <coughs> population by private vehicle uh, would be coming in the southern entrance as, as the school superintendent said, winding around, dropping off, and then leaving. The, the, that entrance will and exit will function as a right turn exit only during school drop off and pick up time. During the middle of the day, if a parent comes to have lunch with the, uh, their child and wants to come to that southern entrance and turn left to go to whatever their needs are, they can turn left at that go time. Go to Costco. They can go to Costco at that Bingo. point. Bingo. <laughs> um, and get the rotisserie chicken for dinner. That's, that's exactly right. But uh, during drop-off pickup time, they'll just be making the right turn. So, as he said, it's a, a constant movement of vehicles so that we don't get things stacked up. Uh, we've got uh, 194 parking spaces shown for both the school and projected uh, future central office building. 147 for the school, 47 then for the projected central office building. Uh, as a comparison, Riverdale without the additional parking lot behind the older gym had 137 parking spaces for a school of 1,430 students. This being a school of 750 design capacity uh, would have the same number of parking places. That's still not going to cover us on the <coughs> night, right. but for anything short of that, we're feeling pretty comfortable. Uh, we've located the, the site, the, the school, in more of the open areas, leaving the large treed area with the identified wetland to the east. This leaves about 14 to 16 acres in, in the eastern part of it, leaving the existing wetland alone, which helps on uh, construction costs just because we're staying out of it. Uh, we 
we've got the existing lake, which can turn into a teaching amenity. It will be uh, recontoured and re-excavated to put in a, a safety shelf, so that should anybody slide down the bank, they've got the safety shelf to stand on, find their way back out before they would hit the water. Uh, we've laid out the school building, the, uh, the service amenities, the outdoor uh, playgrounds and basketball court, as well as a, a central space in between the area, and uh, that really the main functions of the site. What are the red circles? Red circles. Right here. She's asking about this. Oh, those are, oh, those are uh, landscape elements that okay. could be a flowering <coughs> tree, perhaps. Okay. Um, that courtyard is actually sort of a sub courtyard that we'll see when we go and walk through the building. That when you enter the building, um, you immediately see into this little courtyard, and that's where you're looking at. Okay, great, thank you. So, um, what else? See, we did we cover? We had two um, two playgrounds, one uh, pre K and one uh, for the older kids, and the basketball courts outdoors. Um, you know, we have the primary entrance is actually on the south. Of David mentioned the bus drop-off and uh, kids with special needs over here already, but there's a third entrance we should point out, actually, which is the PE entrance. So after hours, the events um, would be entered directly off of the parking lot mm -hmm. on the east side. And then the last entrance worth noting is the, um, the drop-off for servicing. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, your, the dumpsters would be out here, refuse, okay. and, and all of the, um, the big... Uh, deliveries would happen directly into the kitchen area on the northeast corner. Questions on site or circulation? Okay, ready to go inside the building. All right. <laughs> so um, we have a couple of dozen slides, so I'm going to move at a, a, a pretty good pace to stop me and ask questions along the way. Okay. Uh, and I'll jump in here. Yeah. Um, the first thing you'll see that's different from the previous time that we had this we had essentially a box before, where we had uh, the maps uh, courses that were connected by glass hallways to this upper uh, hallway right here that, and also this back hallway right here. We've had to go in several times and dramatically cut costs from this building. And so one of the costs that you have is the amount of external wall that you have. And so um, that was one of the things that we had to give in the design process and it was kind of sad because we lost our village feel but knew that it was gonna be a lot more expensive to do that. So that's why you see the fine arts essentially uh, twisted down from out in this white space right here, twisted down next to these buildings because now I have uh, one external wall here and I'm not paying for those glass hallways that go in between, but knew that that was something we cut for cost purposes. But they will be positioned like this? Yes, so okay, what you so, see yeah. is the way it okay. is positioned now. But that's not what you'd seen previously. Right, that's right, that's yep. right. It's, it is very similar to what we've looked at before. I should note too that we are beginning construction documents. There's basically three phases of the design. There's schematic design, design development, and construction documents. And we've completed both schematic design and design development. And so now what we're doing is putting together a set of drawings based on what we've developed to this point that will be bid by the contractors. Mm -hmm. So, um, and this sort of, you know, diagrams out. Again, so over the overall first floor plan showing all of the yellow boxes are the classrooms on the west side. And then on um, the, the primary entrance being here where the cursor is now. On the uh, east side, we have the admin area and we have the PE area. And then in green appears the dining room. And all of these orange spaces are uh, arts and uh, arts and science and uh, media. And I think there's actually an activity room that's miscolored at the top. So in there on the first floor, more than one activity room. So, um, I think that top upper left yes. one is this an activity right here. room. Yes. Yeah, it says yes. activity. Yes. So we have the activity room sort of spread out within the program. Also should note that the functional skills um, occupational therapy and other you know, specialty type of classrooms are interspersed uh, within the program mm -hmm. as well. They're not isolated into like one, you know, one corner. Um, we, there's an, uh, so for circulation purposes, I'll point out the three staircases going to the second floor. There's one happening here on the north. There's one central right here at the intersection, okay? Mm -hmm. And then there's a third one right by the front door. Um, and the one right across from the front door is an elevator. 
so therefore you can sort of orient yourself like as, as you move, you know, vertically in the building. Are the um, classroom sizes, I mean, how does that compare to say our existing elementary schools? I think they average. Well, are we, what, what, are, what are we, 860? What are the eight, sizes eight, that we 840 have? or so. 840. They're comparable to what you see here in the okay, Riverdale okay. Uh, expansion project. And how does that compare to like a, I, I mean, it depends, I, it depends they, on the these school, feel bigger to me, but I don't know if it's because you have so much light in um, these here. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Okay. So um, I just bumped up to the second floor, and here again you can see the, the three staircases. Um, you can also see the apex room and two apex rooms in this space, as well as another um, activity space. Now we're going to sort of zoom in and go. Well, we'll look at the outside first, and then we'll zoom into each one of these zones. So this is a view of the primary south entrance, and there's a diagram of the plan. At the bottom here, and you can see this little red dot. That's where you're standing. Your That's to help orient you. It's where you are on this on this mm -hmm. building. Mm -hmm. and, um, so the, the <coughs> facade, what we're trying to do at the entrance is sort of scale down the building. So instead of having this massive 110,000 square foot where you know warehouse size facility, we're basically breaking down the building into smaller boxes, and and also using different uh, brick colors. Um, I didn't bring the bricks with me, but we have okay. refined our brick selection. Yeah. The, yeah. yeah. The, um, so the brown is bricks as well, yes. or is it a different medium? No, these are three different colors of brick you see here. There is um, sort of a brown line above the door, and that may be a, a, um, a canopy, a metal canopy. Sure. Okay. So, um, you know, the primary color would be um, a medium gray brick, and then the accent bricks will be a darker, deeper sort of... Um, Called a richer tone, and then mm -hmm. a, another accent brick might be um, a lighter tone. But like 95% of the building would be the, the medium gray brick. Okay. And then the other um, material that's you know evident on the building is the glass, and how we're trying to use glass in a very modern, efficient way. Uh, we're using high performance glass, uh, meaning that it'll have um, a good like shading coefficient. It'll be good for you know the energy sustainability aspect of the project. Um, the glass, you know, um, <coughs> definitely gives some reflectivity on the exterior to the sky and sort of lightens up the building, but it clearly fits primarily from the inside of the building and the experience of the user where they have direct direct views and uh, direct you know, daylight into the building. So we're trying to maximize that as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And to be quite frank, it's not as much as we would like. It was one of those things that we also sort of had to uh, carefully evaluate how we use it strategically during this process. Still more than what we have yes. in a lot of places. A lot so it's, it is, it's, yeah. it's amazing. Okay. Um, here's a second view of the building where here, mm -hmm. all right, so we're, if you orient yourself with the classrooms, you're sort of down here in the southwest corner and you're looking yeah. into. Is that um, the apex room that jets The out? apex room is the one that is cantilevered, yes. Yeah. And okay. so that cantilever also signifies the entrance for the buses and the, the oh. sort of you know, side so entrance. For, so, oh, that makes sense. Yeah, provides. yeah it sort of mm -hmm. is a shelter, but also um, a point that sort of drives your eye, eye to it, like a focal point on the composition of, of the, what's a, re a really regular sort of building. Right. And, you know, we, we feel like the, the, the language of the building, these bars that get sort of sliced, and where they're sliced, there's glass. And it's so evident in that image, whether it's on the second floor, the first floor, or whatever direction it is, it's very uh, clear architectural vocabulary. And we're doing this with, um, I'm gonna call this a very reductive, minimalist, um, you know, uh, aesthetic. It's not supposed to, it's supposed to have a lot of impact for a little, um, for as few moves as possible. Sure. And I think that it does, it can be very powerful. So we'll zoom in now to um, the entry area. Okay. And so this is showing uh, the entry lobby vestibule with the check-in area, which then leads you into the larger lobby and into the rest of the building, or it, through the uh, check-in security area into the admin zone. And not as large a check-in as you see here at Riverdale. It's not as uh, expansive as that one is. It's, it's tighter, but it still has that same feature like we have at Farmington that really controls your access mm -hmm. uh, into the building. One of the things that did change, uh, we also have a smaller admin complex through our design work. Uh, one of the things that the committee talked about was not having all of our guidance workers and our system principals all located in the same place. And if we've got a two-story building, you'll actually see a smaller admin complex elsewhere in the building so there's quick access to wherever they're needed. 
So um, in this plane, you see a couple of orange dots with the, <coughs> the uh, cones mm -hmm. indicating you know, where we're going to look next, and that'll be both in the lobby here. And this is the courtyard I mentioned earlier, sort of a subcourt of the larger court that becomes part of the okay. entrance experience, which allows you not just daylight and daylight and views into the corridor and into the lobby, but views actually into the art space across the way, and views potentially into the science space here. So this image begins to illustrate that. And you can see beyond the trees into the art space. And to the right here would be the gymnasium. So I'm going to pick up, pick up the pace a little bit now. All right. <laughs> oh, sorry. So inside the gymnasium, we're looking at a very similar layout to Riverdale. Uh, we're looking at uh, windows on the east wall. And the blue, <coughs> what you see in blue is actually um, an acoustic treatment. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now we'll, we'll go up to the north uh, zone of the building with the PE, I mean with the uh, dining hall and the arts areas. Um, and we'll then zoom in and have a few different uh, uh, camera views to look at here. We found that this area, you see the, the, the way the building is sort of non-orthogonal and has some rotation to it. That's um, an awfully big word. Yeah. Right. Well, what we're trying to do here is, again, break up the scale of this massive building. Absolutely. And what this does is it allows for some variation in the experience of the corridors. Um, it, it still allows for these sort of, you know, entry types of transitional spaces as you go into the media center or as you would actually pass from uh, the PE and the dining space, you can pass through this area here to the, out, to the outside if they want to. Go back to for me. I wanted to highlight one thing. Um, yes, this. I think what's uh, exceptional that you'll see throughout the school is a similar feel like we have here in the mm -hmm. Riverdale complex is the glass that really engages you with that one courtyard and makes you feel like you're not inside. And so when you come into the building, you're going to see this. And throughout this design, you'll have these views where you're um, seeing not only on the other side of that courtyard right, right there, that exterior courtyard, you're seeing into another classroom. So you're going to see these connectivity views throughout the building that really engage you with the outside yeah. uh, surroundings. And, and one of the challenges is, you know, these long corridors, and we always, in almost every case in this building, we've been able to put a window at the end of the corridor. So there's some daylight. It's not like you're looking down at the right. end. But one of the more challenging corridors was um, this space here, which we found a good solution to, that, as I was describing earlier, but it's also very efficient. All of this, these three orange spaces and the bathrooms are all actually part of the same structural grid. So we're doing this with some efficiency. Now, now if we're Do you in, have a picture of that from the outside? I mean, not go to it now, but will we see? I'm, visual, I'm visually challenged. So just to be able to see this from the outside, you know, how it, it's just very unique. Okay. Um, I, mean, I don't have to. I'm just. Is there, follow up with one. Oh, yeah, no worries. Okay, okay. maybe I will send you something tomorrow. Yeah, no I'll worries, no worries. No worries. But, that's but, just we, my but we do have some images of what it's like inside. Yeah. So these are the. Um, the, the, these are views from inside the corridor that we were just looking at. And mm -hmm. what you see here is a view on the left into the media center, okay? And that yellow um, piece on the wall yeah, could, that. could serve as a, a, a place for uh, children to sit. It could be a place for display. It's a reading room where you could sit and read inside the shape, inside the object. And it goes through from outside the library if they're waiting to go yeah. into the library and also inside the library. Yeah. They can be sitting waiting for it's time for them to go. And so the door on the right is it's, it's an exterior egress door, but we again maximize the, the windows around it. Um, this is a view inside of Media Center, aka the library. <laughs> yeah, I, was, yeah. I, I had to write that down, okay. the library. <laughs> and this is the, what you see in the foreground. The orange is the uh, librarian's desk, and then you look back down into the, the hallway we were just discussing. Right. Another view inside of the media center, That's and you can amazing. see on the left the large windows with daylights and views. The ceiling height is especially The nice. ceiling height is taller in here, mm -hmm. and we'll go back in the corridor. You'll see what we're showing here is an exposed structure, mm -hmm. but this to sort of maximize that sort of lofty experience mm -hmm. in the in the corridor. Um, nice. It would be painted a lighter color. In fact, these images might look a little dark in my mind. I think the actual experience of the space would be a bit brighter. And once again, you can see in this image, we've tried to connect to the outside. Mm -hmm. um, so you're seeing through the cafeteria, through mm -hmm. the windows, and you can see the trees and the grass and the, and the area that's outside. So it, it just connects you whatever hallway you're in. Hopefully you have a view that you can see the outside right. world. So um, we'll go from outside the cafeteria to inside the cafeteria. And again, you can get a better 
view of the, the windows and get a sense of the scale of the space. Um, and then turning our camera around, we can see the stage now, the, I mean the platform, sorry. We're, um, we're calling this the performance platform, um, which we will, uh, we're working closely with Germantown to sort of refine exactly what goes in, into that in terms of lighting. And, uh, all right, so we're gonna go back out into the corridor and here you can see the exposed structure, the dependent light. Um, potential for different materials, different color paint to sort of accentuate those volumes that are defining the, the spaces in the corridor. And we haven't chosen internal colors yet, so don't get stuck oh, on the color yeah. patterns or... Uh... I'm liking the orange, <laughs> just saying. <laughs> this image is inside of one of the art rooms uh, looking out into the courtyard. Um, and I'm sorry, can I, the, the, the stage, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a day late. Is that, how does the space that y'all have set out for that, is that like, is, is it bigger than, it's bigger I mean, than everything seems to be bigger, so it'll be bigger <coughs> than what's typically. It's designed for a Broadway show the way we have our place at our school. Okay, So awesome. we have a sound booth in the back, of, that was that box that's in the back of the cafeteria. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <coughs> you notice the ceiling, it's arranged so that it's staggered so that we can have oh, theater nice. quality lights that are, that are in that space too. Okay. It's got more space on the sides. So we can have so it is a lot it is okay. not like our other stages it's very it nice. is a true stage true stage <laughs> okay that's <laughs> very nice thank you lighting control and sound control kind of see it. so you go back to the right of course that so you can oh see yeah the control booth mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. in the back for our performance nice excellent thank you okay so we left off on this art room looking through the um, one of the, the glass walls into the, the courtyard um, and now we will <coughs> zoom into um, a typical classroom uh, area on the first floor. And we're looking mostly at activity space and the experience of the corridor. Um, this is uh, the activity space on the, the first floor in the, in the corridor. You look into it through um, mm -hmm. floor to ceiling glass in the corridor. And then inside of the space, um, uh, Jason previously described this pretty well, so we need to go through a, a numerous possibilities of how the school can use these common spaces. But it also brings light into the hallway. Because yes. you've got uh, the exterior glass wall and you've got this glass wall on the hallway, it's going to be a way that we can really break up those corridors and bring more light into the building. Yeah, an activity, you know, just sort of seeing what's going on. So um, the next space, this is a typical classroom on the first floor showing uh, the wall with the potential layout for the cubbies. We're thinking about doing something. Um, you know, a little more playful with, with the, the cubbies. It may or may not be something like that. Um, and the other important wall in the teaching room is the, the, in the classroom is the teaching wall. Um, what's missing from this image, though, is the projector. So those are really the two things that define the, the teaching walls, the projector and the marker board. And very large windows, bigger than what we have in our other schools. Mm -hmm. yes. so that, uh, it is going to have a lot of light. Uh, Stuart, do you know how big those windows are on the camera? Here? Uh, Three and a half by eight. Chris has got us. There you go. Three and a half by eight. Very big window. Wow. Like four by eight. Four by eight. Thirty square feet. Um, okay. So now we're going to go upstairs. All right. And zoom in on this area. And what we're going to look at here is more about the experience of the corridor. And another feature that we brought into the corridor to break up the space is a light well. And in order to describe the light well to you, this image is a section through the building where you see basically a, um, a, a window up at the roof level that then creases, is part of the shaft that brings light all the way down into the second floor and into the first floor. And this happens, um, it would, you would experience it like this on the second floor. And what this does is it just brings more natural daylight into the core of the building where there are no, no windows immediately adjacent to the corridor. Thank you. I love that. Yeah, that's really amazing. Can we go back two for me. Um, once again, go back one more. We talked about the uh, smaller administrative complex, so you do have offices for a guidance mm -hmm. counselor and assistant principal. Oh, yeah. And you have a workroom there. You also have the apex. It also has a glass wall uh, on it that brings brings light into the, the building. So, right. So the, here's the, the two offices you just mentioned. Yeah. Okay. The teacher work area. Um, And you can look down this hallway, you'll see um, an orange and uh, neutral color color scheme. But in another hallway, it might be a blue, you know, colored, you know, 
color scheme just to sort of give differentiation between hallways as far as wayfinding and they understand where no, where you are. Absolutely. <laughs> that's that's the last slide. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, any other questions any, about any that? Questions? Was there a uh, we we important? have some slight changes that we're gonna make to the special ed rooms like the, the sensory room where how it's connected to functional skills. Okay. Uh, we got um, looking at moving preschool classrooms so that we can have a, a bathroom in the preschool classroom. So there are some smaller tweaks that we have with the facility, but we're getting really tight on um, where we are on design. So okay. now, like uh, Chris said, we're getting moving into the actual how the walls are constructed, the, the plumbing, the electrical, the construction Yes, the construction documents. Question on the um, teacher workroom. Um, we've got a teacher dining room downstairs. I'm assuming they'll and a teacher workroom upstairs. So um, will they, sh I guess, share those spaces so the upstairs teachers will come downstairs yes. to eat? So this is, yes, it's not and like then this the workroom will be upstairs. Yes. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that was clear to me in my brain. Um, is there a bathroom for the teachers upstairs? I haven't. Not specifically for the teachers upstairs. I was just curious. Well, that, that's a good question. So, um, where are the adult? I call them adult bathrooms more than just the children. Well, are they the ones back by the lobby? I guess how, many, how many teacher bathrooms are there? Well, we're showing uh, well One, two, two in the two in the um, area for the for dining, eating. but then also okay. in the admin area, we have I think three or four. Yeah. Okay. There and one, then there two. are. Um, and that's, if I remember correctly, that's kind of off the lobby, the teacher yes. dining, right? You yes. kind of go through the lobby and then it's to the left, is yes. that correct? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So kind of in the central part. So there isn't one upstairs. They're going to have to come down. Or, okay, okay. or use the kids' bathroom. Mm -hmm. But at least upstairs, they would be larger toilets than maybe the kindergarten size. Yeah. I'm just saying, if you've ever tried to go on the kindergarten, the kindergarten bathrooms, it's a little bit hard yeah. as an adult. <laughs> well, we, we will look at an adult okay. bathroom. I think we need to look yeah, at. there's something. Like I, just to consider, as a teacher, yeah, it would there's be some nice. plumbing up there that they could hook into, and put a, even if just a small one. Yeah. Yeah. So one, yeah. one would yeah. be enough for yeah. dogwood size. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, Smaller that. than a closet. Okay. Any, any other other this is a gorgeous building. Yeah, it's very nicely it is done. Gorgeous building. Very nicely done. I'm so Thank excited. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for your work. Thank you, Kate. Thanks, Kate. Next on our agenda is ENA contract renewal. Mr. Pierce. You can come right here since the microphone's right here. Yes. But just for, so if people are asking about the building, like I said, you can direct them to that one site because we will have all this on there so that they can access it. Um, so just know we'll have those images. I think it's just going to make people excited. I think so. Really. That's brilliant. Good evening. Good evening. Um, so we're going to talk about a DNA contract for our data and WAN and voice services. Um, normally, uh, well actually our, our current contract doesn't expire until the end of June of this upcoming summer. However, as part of the E-rate program, which is the federal government's program that subsidizes costs for high-speed internet for schools and libraries, they are going to bump up the filing window for that starting in January. Um, we have to file for reimbursement for this reimbursement uh, our provider. Do we, do we get much? Because I know it's it's well, based on specific it's, schools. Yes, it's obviously. based on the uh, yeah. your free and reduced yeah. lunch rate. But it is um, we get some. And yeah. out of that yeah. and out of that money we pay the E rate consortium. Is that correct? Well we have Are a they, consultant. Right. We have a consultant. Yeah, right. yeah, the consultant um, we, the minimum the, discount level they offer is forty percent, which is what we call I mean, what we get because you know we're the one of the lowest free and reduced rates uh, in the state. Actually, I think we are the lowest. We edged out Brentwood by like a quarter of a point, something like that. Um, mm -hmm. But anyway, so we get a 40% discount on our uh, data coverage every year. Um, we have to file for that. It gets uh, processed through the USAC as an organization that works through the federal government. So they are opening the filing window for that in January. 
Um, so our ERA consultant uh, would like for us to go ahead and get on the Metro Natural contract, uh, which is a much larger consortium. Um, and so I'm, I'll explain this to you. Yeah, so sure. the state bid this out, so they said, okay, if everyone's using E-rate, let's go ahead and have a state contract so that everybody's not doing their own individual bids for this. So that's this Nashville consortium. So essentially we can just say, yes, we want to join uh, that and get that rate. Yeah, currently 131 out of the 140 school districts in the state purchase off of this uh, contract. Uh, mm -hmm. So our great consultant would like us to move over because it's less of a risk of not being funded. Not that that we wouldn't be funded, but it's a much, you know, playing the percentages, it's like, you know, it's a lot, a lot less risky if we're part of a much larger consortium than what we're currently on. So uh, that's that's the request. That's, that's it. <laughs> Sounds great to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sounds good, Miss. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Pierce. Thank you. Thank you. Next is um, the LEA compliance report. Um, this one's really simple. I forgot. We it is something that we have to do every year that says yeah. that we are compliant with state policies mm -hmm. and procedures, mm -hmm. and so the board has to approve this at a board meeting. Thank That's you. the form. Yeah, I read it. And I thought, wow, there's just not, not much to that. No. <laughs> it's just saying you're you are yes, we follow to the, rules. the laws and rules. Good. Um, okay, since there's no other questions on the compliance report, the next is the school funds 1617 audit report. Ms. Mona, do you want to Ms. come on up? Since in here is exciting as the new school. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, it is. <laughs> I just Mr. Love. Jones couldn't be here this afternoon, and he just asked uh, me to, y'all each want to take one of these, present our school audit. Thank you. Uh, the communication that we got from Watkins Uberall, you know, the state says that we are required to be audited by an outside audit firm, and uh, Watkins Uberall was our audit firm for the 2016-17 school year. <clears throat> and this communication pretty much says we were easy to work with, <laughs> and uh, there were no issues that they had getting the information that they needed. Um, Mr. Jones kind of wanted me to just go through a few things to highlight with you all. So if you'll uh, open your book and turn it to page five. And look at the combined balance sheet. If you'll look at our uh, general fund unassigned, we had $420,542. And that was a combined general fund of all of our five schools. Uh, if you'll turn to page seven. He wanted to highlight the student activity funds. I know you all hear a lot about uh, student activity funds. And this kind of broke it down as to what those are. Basically anything that involves a student and money is pretty much classified as student activity funds. Uh, if you'll turn to page 13. Monica, can I ask, what, what is the, um, when you get, I'm sorry, back to five, uh -huh. um, general fund unassigned, what, what is that? Um, you know, our, in, in our schools, we have two funds. We have the general fund and we have the restricted fund. Mm -hmm. The general fund is, um, the way we get money there is either by donation okay. uh, or by fundraising. And okay. we'll see when we look at Dogwood as an example. Okay. Um, and the general fund is to be spent by the good of all. Okay. Uh, so you can't spend it on, say, a cheerleading group because that's not all the children. You might could spend it on a fifth grade class having an incentive party because the concept is everybody at one time is going to be in the fifth grade at, at your school. Okay. Right. Uh, but it, but any time you spend out of that fund, you have to consider the whole entire student population. And this is just the timing of how that's coming in as right. well sitting there. Right. Okay. okay. Thank you. And if you'll turn to page uh, 13, this is just an example, say, of Dogwood, the statement of revenues and expenditures. This is the general fund. It's basically one fund that we break off into several uh, subgroups. Um, and you'll see like bookstore, spirit wear, school pictures. Uh, like I said, the primary way we fund this is really by fundraising dollars. You know, selling yearbooks, our, our bookstores, our school pictures. Um, the only other thing would be unallocated donations. If somebody wanted to give you $500, 
and didn't tie anything, any restricted on that, uh, this is where you okay. would put it. Uh, the other accounts, administration instruction, they're just really expense accounts. Uh, we bring the money into those fundraising accounts and then it's spent out of the expense accounts. You know, if it's office related, it's administrative. If it's instruction for the teachers, it's out of the instructional account maintenance okay. uh, for school building. Uh, 14 is our restricted fund, and you can kind of look down there and see what Dogwood has, the library, uh, sports club, music, art department, our clubs are here. Uh, and these are standalone, they're like little bank accounts. You can't spend out of them unless there's money in the account to spend. And they're only restricted for what they say they are. Like if you look at library, library can only spend out of that account anything related to the library. Okay. And uh, page 15, uh, just kind of the, the end of the restricted fund, uh, their donation accounts. Also in these accounts, you'll see our BEP money. Um, we don't ask our schools to do any type of reimbursement just to save on paperwork, either on the district side and on the school side. We roll all our funds out to the schools and allow them uh, to spend. So we're giving uh, allocations for our teachers, for teacher discretionary, our SPED money, um, library, uh, fee waiver. That we've given them in this BP. There's furniture accounts. Furniture allowance, copier. Um, more money than I ever had when I was the principal. Absolutely, of the it is. They are, they are <laughs> we are way more generous than Shelby <laughs> County Schools was. <laughs> so there is actual money that they can do. They can improve their schools, not just maintain. Absolutely. Well. And if you turn to page forty, um, this is what we we kind of dread. Um, is our schedule of I'm sorry. If yes, we get back, I just had a question when I was going through the report um, on the high school. Um, in, on page 22, there's a line item for instruction for 160,000. I was just curious what that covers. Page 22. Instruction is anything for the teachers. It could be uh, any type of testing materials, okay. supplies okay. for the teachers. Okay. Okay. Um, I know we say at Houston, I don't know if they've implemented every school. I know you implemented at Houston Middle, but we actually have a store room for our teachers for supplies. We keep them on hand. They don't have to come in and say, I'm out of this. They say, I'm out of it, and we go and give it to them, That's which fine. is unlike a lot of schools. Sure, sure. And so we do, we do spend a certain amount, and we also start our teachers off at Houston at the beginning of the school year, we give them a bag of all supplies to start mm -hmm. off. They're staples, mm -hmm. you know, rulers, Scantron mm -hmm. cards for the scanners I use maybe for multiple um, testing. And, um, and this is this is revenue that's coming in as donation or this is revenue This was revenue that was spent. I'm sorry. Those are expenditures. Um, well, there's expenditures and revenue. Expenditures the well, both, but, well, more the revenues, that's, I'm trying to. Where does that come from? This one, yeah. You know, it could be for, for donation. Okay. Uh, we don't necessarily, you know, maybe they restricted it for the instructional use for the teachers. More than likely, it was probably donation uh, that came from somewhere. And we can do a printout. To see yeah, I'd have to pull that. No, I was just, I was just curious. I just, you know, I was just going so, through and just saw a big number. That's, that's a bigger all. number. Yeah, yeah. So just bigger than what I normally see. So okay. She she it's it's high school. It's easy to, everything's easy magnified. To and you have more teachers. Right. Well, yeah, I was just curious if that came from us. The district or, or from comes from, from parents, parents or from or outside. PTA or where does that come from and you can see that too okay um, and then on the next page 23 um, would band be a separate line item here or is it in something would it's that be in the general clubs it's a separate line item band it is, is this for the high school yes <coughs> I just didn't see it I just didn't know if that's it's a restricted account it's a restricted account yeah. I thought so I just didn't see it I didn't know if I was missing it yeah, they have their they have a account that's separate. Yeah, there's yeah, I just didn't see it on the list. They have their own 501c3. Oh, so it would be in here. Yeah, so the booster separate club boosters are also separate too. Okay, so that doesn't so if it's yeah. separate like that, it won't come through this. That's right. We would not see that. That's account. that's they're a five hundred one c three. So they got it. Okay, okay. So that, these that, are the that, ones that still support organizations. Thank you. That's where I was getting myself confused. I'm sorry. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. Thank you for clarifying that. Okay. All right. If we move on to page forty. 
Uh, we got three audit findings this year. Uh, the first one was at Dogwood. Uh, the explanation was purchase requisition form not properly canceled. Um, I want to say we're not audited uh, really on fraud or things like that. We're audited by compliance uh, with the Internal School Uniform Accounting Policy Manual. And it's not been updated in many years. And there are some, uh, there are some items in there that are a lot of busy work to our ladies. But this particular audit finding was everything that is attached to the check, any type of receiving report, it could be a gum wrapper, just anything that had to do with that transaction has to be stamp paid. Mm -hmm. And you know, when you're in a hurry, when you're doing things, when you're interrupted a thousand times, that, that, like these ladies are, mm -hmm. there was so one sheet. There was one sheet that was part of that packet. Okay. On the packet. Yeah. That, that, and, that's and what they the go audit finding was. They just pull random. Oh no, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. They, yeah. they don't go through everything. Think, it just, yeah. It's very few audits that come back 100 percent without yeah. something. Without yeah. one yeah. small paperwork, absolutely. something. They, they, they don't feel like they've done their. Yeah. That's right. And if they do, then. And it's on a broad scope, like you have a large district that has no audit funding, that should make you question you yeah. your, your yeah. the, yeah. Mm -hmm. how good the audit is. Well, especially with the amount of detail to your point yes. that you have to go through. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Farmington received an audit finding. Uh, the finding was collections not submitted in a timely manner. This has to do with, um, you know, our uh, we ask that the money be brought up to the school office by noon each day. Uh, the deposit usually leaves the school to go to the bank around 2 o'clock. But teachers, you know, sometimes get money late in the day or whatever, and so lo and behold, they bring it up to the office. Well, we do have a way to account for that, and we want to make sure that we, you know, verify the funds before we lock them up. And so we have a stamp that says, you know, received amount, mm -hmm. initials who counted the money before it's locked up in the safe. And this was just something that was an after school money, you know, after the, the deposit left, but it just wasn't stamped. I'm sure it was counted, but sometimes, you know, like I said, when you're at the end of the day in a hurry, things happen. Um, this was another one at Farmington, uh, records for fundraisers not properly maintained. Uh, in all my years, this was the first time that it was ever questioned in an audit. Um, you know, uh, the state says if you use a vendor that is going to collect money uh, during a fundraiser and give you a, a, a percentage of that profit, how do you know you got what your fair share? And this had to do with school pictures. Uh, Holland Studios collects our money. We don't open the envelopes. We just give them the money. Right. And so how do we know that we got um, our 50%? And so somehow we're supposed to independently verify that we did that. I happen to know uh, that, that our bookkeeper did do that, ran a tape on it. But somehow the tape got separated from our fundraiser uh, analysis that we have to do. And she just couldn't find it the day of the audit. But you know, it's kind of hard to do that when you, we don't want to open the envelopes and get involved in, in that kind of money. That's the whole purpose of an outside vendor being able to do this for us. But mm -hmm. unfortunately, that's part of the step. But we've worked out a way to, to accommodate that this, uh, this school year. So um, anyway, but um, I do want to say we have five very good ladies that work very hard and they take this audit so personal um, when they get an audit finding. But they literally touch everything that happens in our school. Mm -hmm. You know, whether someone's paid, whether it's a, buying a pencil in the bookstore, mm -hmm. helping a teacher with their supplies, and they just handle thousands of sheets of paper. And um, some days I don't know how they do it because uh, interruptions are really their, their um, <laughs> yeah. well, and it's their main roadblock into really right. completing, right. you know, getting on something and getting that interruption that our teachers have you know, planning periods, different hours of the day, mm -hmm. and so it's mm -hmm. a it's a revolving door in, into the bookkeeper's office. And um, but they do a really good job. Um, I'm just really proud of all of them. Yes, <laughs> well, thank you for all the hard work. We know that it's well, they do. The they're scenes, they're not paid it's... enough. I'm going to tell you, <laughs> <laughs> we're working on that too. <laughs> anyway, John, have any questions? No, no, ma'am. Great. great job. Thank you, ma'am. Uh huh. You're thank welcome. You, good audit. Thank you. Next on our agenda is the miscellaneous 1718 budget amendment, number 12. And Ms. Huffman is going to explain this budget amendment. Hello. Hey, good to see everybody. So I have a visual, but I'm apologizing on the front end because my visual has a typo that I noticed when I got here. So um, I apologize. But I think it's easier to see when talking about this to see a chart. Um, the additional teaching position, because the budget amendment is asking for an additional teaching position and paraprofessional. 
the teaching position when we plan for like in December and in the spring for budget for the following year. The only known numbers for preschool are those that we receive from TEIS. Well, we have had a ton of community <coughs> members. Um, I'm hey, hold on. I'm going to stop you for a second. Please. So whenever we have an acronym, TEIS, Tennessee Early Sorry, Intervention. Yes, mm -hmm. sorry. So um, that, it's a shot in the dark. Uh, what is it? When students turn three, they can enroll in our yeah. preschool right. program. And we don't know how many there sure. are out there waiting to come to us. So we're going to see that now. Sorry. Yes. So TEIS is the only known, but the unknown is community. So TEIS sends, um, but we get late referrals. There's all kinds of things that change sure. these numbers. So we update these on a monthly basis to watch and see because we don't ever want those numbers to get over what they need to be. And moving into, by January, we were looking at Farmington's numbers going, ah, we've got to do something. So the visual here shows you our current numbers at each elementary. Um, we have 12 students plus two typical uh, peers at Farmington. At Dogwood, there's five plus two typicals. And at Riverdale, we're at 12 plus two typicals. And so looking at the additions to the classroom, and these are known. So we know that we're going to have three additional students by January in the Farmington room. Um, one's coming in February and then another possibility in May. That's going to put them at a possibility of 19. Why I say possibility, the one in May may not qualify, sure. but there's always a possibility they will. There is not room for 19 bodies in the classroom. Um, the State Department will allow us 20 looking at the square footage, but we just don't feel like that's a good educational decision. Um, it will become more babysitting and not instructional practices. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> you might ask yourself, well, Riverdale and Farmington look very similar. So talking through that, Riverdale is staffed differently than Farmington with paraprofessionals because of the needs of the students. Um, we are also looking, if you look at where their additions are coming in, they will have two more by February, and then there's a possibility of March and May. What we may do, and depending on community members that call that are unknowns right now, is look at, depending on the size of the classroom at that time, do we need to offer them an option to go to Farmington or to Dogwood to alleviate numbers at Riverdale getting any larger. Riverdale does not have a current space for a second preschooler. So we came through and kind of talked to the administration and teacher here as well, um, as at Farmington that we felt like the bigger need was at Farmington at this point. So that's the teaching position. Questions? So that's the request them. today is to do a bunch of amendments based on the predictive of we're going to have to split our preschool at Farmington. We need another teaching position. Now the additional two positions we put on reserve after we filled, after you used the ones we needed to use. We had five in reserve yeah. for, right. for growth, and then we added an additional no, two. two. Yes. So this will be an additional this one This will be well. additional on top okay. of that. So, so those, uh, those yes, other two we were used. used. Yes. Okay. And we're growing. That, I was, yeah, that's, that's <laughs> wonderful. I just wanted to <laughs> ask because I hadn't heard that we had used those yes. additional two. So will, they, will you be waiting until you have those students to hire? Are you going to hire someone now to get them? I would like to post now with a start date of January 1. That okay. way, if there's a 30-day right. issue in right. um, any other school system, right. that it will allot for that time. And so Do we get any Title I funding for this? Not for special ed position. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry, so Farmington, I understand that we're going to have a second classroom, so we're going to split those. And so explain again about Riverdale, about why, if, if they're similar, why we would not do that. So looking at the disabilities of the students in the two classrooms okay. and the knowns and the unknowns. So we, and I can't go into specifics oh, about yeah. students, but the four that are coming to Farmington, we know we're going to qualify because we have, I mean, we haven't had that eligibility meeting. So they're looking meeting. at the needs of the students. Yeah, but we do know that they're going to qualify. That's right. Okay. Qualify. Okay. Um, whereas at our Riverdale situation, we're not sure if they're going to qualify and if they are, are we going to add them or offer them another option? Okay. And so that, that would be a discussion for the next year if yes. we, okay. Okay. As we see how that rolls. And okay. there, there is no additional pre space to do a second room. Is, is that from here at, at this time, time in, mm -hmm. in Riverdale? That's right. That could potentially, but okay, I'm okay. That's, so that's process. something too, like another reason for us when we look at uh, eliminating transfers except for employees, children. Um, that's another reason for us too, is to have space at Riverdale uh, so that we do have. Right. 
Okay. And okay. Mr. Blaine and I have talked to you about the new elementary and zoning, and we just happened to get a ton of kids at these two locations, mm -hmm. and Dogwood historically has not had a ton of referrals or from TEIS. So right. How can that assist moving forward? Okay. Any Thank other you. questions? Sounds good. Thank you, Ms. Huffman. Next is HR policy revision second reading. Um, and this one's oh, really I'm sorry, that was the budget amendment, right? Yes. yes. What is the two million reserves on the budget amendment? I think that's where they're pulling from. It's it it was from. just a lot more than. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Are you talking about the two one six yeah, three? Mm -hmm. I don't know why that what what other we've made other changes since then. I think we had to recognize um, I think we used some of that money for the previous growth. I, that's position. what I'm thinking, but I just I just I just didn't know why it was still Yes, well it listed. Oh it's approved, never mind. I, I, I was looking at the wrong one. You're right. So we've already approved it. No, 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 I was looking at the rec the requested is what we should be looking yes. at. I'm sorry. I got it. Never mind. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions on the budget amendment? Next is the HR policy revision second reading. Um, and this one, Mr. Hatter reached out to. I reached out to. Yes, yes. And I'll let you take the lead. Well, no, I don't know what, what his discussion was with them. But I know there were some questions on this one about staff rights and not delineating educators, the teachers, versus um, paraprofessionals and the classified staff. Um, they said they're we can just sort of modify it ourselves. It's not going to have an effect. So, I mean, if we wanted to, we could say each staff member has the right to, um, when I looked through it, I thought, go ahead and put each staff member has the right to. So one, two, take out educators have the right yes, to. Yes. And then make it three, four, five, six, seven. Um, and then leave the responsibility. And, yeah. and actually, you could, I mean, you could move, oh, let me go one more. Yeah. You could change the other one, then each, um, educator has the responsibility to and you could divide it a little more mm -hmm. um, and what you could do is um, if you wanted you could take um, because we were, you could number them the whole way down mm -hmm. um, the teacher code of ethics yeah. really does apply to anybody that's working in school right. um, it's whether we make sure we want to make it available to them so I mean I think that's it, that's it. you could decide did you want do you want to have a separate educator section or do you want to just number it all the way through? Well, well I is staff rights and responsibilities, right? I think I think no, I think it's good. I think it's good the way it is that way, and then like you suggested, I think it's perfect. Number it down and then leave it as I would just leave it as staff member has the responsibility too because that covers both staff and educators. Because our yeah. and the yep. where appropriate dress for work, that does apply to both. Everybody should apply. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, and I think that's what we talked about last time is that staff member covers everyone, even the educators within the, the schools. Is that accurate? Yes. Okay. So, right. yes, yeah, so I think you just delete that line and change the numbering and that would cover that. Well, instead of doing that, why don't you just put each staff member has the right to, yeah. and then seven, each staff member has the right to, and then leave the 24 line back. So all you're doing is changing one line instead of the numbers. 42, yeah. Mm -hmm. Is it redundant? Not really. Would you to go yeah, to number seven? What if you just delete? Did you get those staff members? Well, all you're doing seven. is changing yeah. line seven to each you staff working, member. You copy right. line three right. over to line seven, yeah. and it solves all the problems without renumbering. And mm -hmm. yes. mm -hmm. and you're not changing 24, and you're not changing the numbers. Well, I think we agree we didn't have to change 24. 24 on, we wouldn't need to make any changes because that applies to everybody. That's more responsibilities mm -hmm. that the staff members right. have versus the rights. The only thing that would change. Is line is seven. Identifying seven. educators as separate from staff. And we don't need to do that. Mm -hmm. So everybody's in agreement. Takes number seven, you're going to take out educators have the right to. Mm -hmm. And copy line three over to line seven. I just. Unless just you, the, gra unless you just the grammar to person in me is, is thinking redundant, redundant, because it's saying the same thing twice. Yeah, but you've got two things there, and then you've got. But why, seven things here. 
Right, but they all apply to the same group. But a staff member is a teacher or a staff member or anybody who works at the school. Right, I'm just saying that all, all nine of those would apply to that group, that term, mm -hmm. the staff member. I just think it's cleaner, but I'll, I'm, I will vote positively for either, yeah. either situation. <laughs> either yeah, vote all of I'm just trying to keep it simple. Keep yeah. it simple, yeah. So either, either way, I'm so, good. So Ms. Vijaya knows that we're clear, so she's clear. What we want to do is, is each staff member has the right to, on line three, leaving that there, we're taking out seven. Just the word indicators? Just the whole thing. I think we're going to yes. eliminate that line and read number three, four, five, six, seven, okay. yeah. all the way down here. To and nine. Then from here down, okay. 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 Awesome. Any other questions or um, that's perfect. point that you want to bring that's out? Perfect. Thank you. And nine. Yes, so ma'am. Yes, ma so seven is nine. And seven, eight, nine. You want me to change it now so you can still have it in the consent, or you want to pull it off the consent? I think is there been an agreement with it? I yes, it, yeah. There, there, we're really not changing the main. I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's really yes. just oh, standard consent. Yes, changes and it's right. just mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Just Jay. clarifying. Yes. Um, next is a new policy for alternative school program. First reading, Mr. Bland. is a new policy that if you operate an alternative program or an alternative school, you should have a policy that uh, states kind of outlines the program. So we did not okay. have one, so we are implementing one now. Okay. So it's just a matter we didn't have one. Just a yes. matter of that, that was, we, <laughs> we didn't that have I actually it. wrote down, what was the it, goal of this policy? We didn't have it yeah. and we have to have Perfect. one. And then there is a clarification on policy reviews on the dress code policy. Yes. Um, I think last time you all had asked about the yes. spandex. Yes. So that we we just for clarity, we took it out. They, um, you also remove PJs. Yes. Because they you, do wear them for different events, like they pay money right. to wear PJs. And so the PJ days. Yes. yes. Right. So the principal has autonomy on six yes. lines six through eight on the page two. Right. You can see they have they can have a PJ day. But normal pajama wear. Um, then do we need to? Where are you? On, <laughs> sorry. We went backwards. We went backwards. We, we skipped this one. So dress code six point three one zero. So I guess my question is, do we do we need to? Since the administrator has the right to make exceptions in six, seven, and eight for special occasions. Do we really need to remove sleepwear, or can they go back and say, look, I can wear my PJ pants because it's not listed specifically. And I know that sounds ridiculous, but we see PJ pants everywhere. And say that again. That's, so it's her that's concern why. is if you she take wants to it leave out, sleepwear people the, will think they can wear it. Yes, and they will. High school out. students yeah. will wear it. For sure. I, if you take it out, <laughs> <laughs> right now, you will too. They yeah. will too. Because bunnies if you take, remove it from prohibited items. Yeah. They will feel like they, they, they yes. will feel yes. yes. High whatever, school students, yeah. middle school whatever women. Whatever wording you guys are doing. Yeah. 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 So we will leave. So because the, Mr. Cherry still has the ability yeah. to, yes. to override. Yes. That's right. right. Yeah. The days like in middle school did. That's right. Or the elementary. They did wear the PJs for. Yeah. Pay a dollar, get more PJs. So you want to leave in. So we're gonna. So on line eight. Keep number four. Or actually line twenty-eight. We're gonna keep number four sleepwear and pajamas. Okay. But on line six, we're, we're still going to remove that. And it's like we clarified last time. The fact that you have spandex and, and tights is not in and of itself a banned item. Right. It's what you're wearing on top of that and the length of that item on top of it. Mm -hmm. So they can wear spandex. They can wear the tights as long as the, you know, they have their long shirt yes, or outfit that goes yes. over that. And, and, is that. and where would that be said? We, we can put just because you can doesn't mean you should. should. <laughs> I think that should be a life lesson right there. <laughs> so yeah, so lines three through five. Yeah. On the next page. On the second page. Is that is that three number nine in this? Is it? Yeah. <laughs> it's three through five, so you can't wear it. Yeah. Try it And it's always at the discretion yeah. of, the of the principal. I mean, if he and the teachers, they monitor. Oh, the I see the. Okay, I got it. I got it. Okay. They're in the halls. They monitor. And it's also in line There's two where problem. it says 
shirts, blouses, and dresses must completely cover the abdomen, back, shoulders, and must have sleeves. Um, talking about no midriff, um, so it's also a making sure, just making yes. sure it's yeah, okay, mm -hmm. appropriate. Okay. So, Mr. J, we're just not taking out the PJs on that. Thanks. That way, I don't sleep have to on the jump. Yes, the well, sleepwear. Yes. Oh. So, Mr. Pierce can't wear them. I would protest. Uh, <laughs> yes, no PJs, Mr. Pierce. <laughs> Um, did we <laughs> did we go through teacher tenure? I had something. Was that on our list or not? I don't think teacher. Yeah, it, I did not. It's on the second. It's on the second. The second reading. We're not there yet. I'm sorry. Okay. Got myself messed up here. Okay. Uh, any other questions for Mr. Bland? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Next is the approval of the architect proposal for the Houston High Field House. Hello, Mr. Good evening. Good evening. Hello. No, I can. <coughs> well, there, uh, there were a, a few things that uh, I wanted to mention earlier uh, to circle back to the new elementary school for a second. I know it's probably not on the forefront of your minds, but a school name uh, is something that you guys need to start thinking about because it does have an effect on some of the design elements as we're going through design for the new school. So. I don't have any suggestions or anything like well, that. I but just I'm but, but at least put that on your minds that that okay. may be something that needs to be decided on before we get all the way through uh, bidding. Um, we have already gone through the Board of Zoning and Appeals and gotten approval there. Uh, we are scheduled to be on the Planning Commission uh, November 7th and the Design Review Commission November 28th. And we are also meeting with neighbors uh, of that new site. Uh, October 26th, which is this Thursday at mm -hmm. 6 p.m. right here in the multi-purpose room. I uh, was sent out letters to everyone uh, that was in a certain radius. I, I hope Meredith got the letter. Very good. So we sent out letters to everyone that was in a certain radius to uh, Thursday night at 6 o'clock. And that's mainly to give them the same update that you guys. We wanted to make sure you'd seen it first before they see it, sure. and then uh, and and then to answer any questions or listen to any concerns that they have prior to going to the planning commission meeting. Um, as it relates to this item, which is the, uh, the Fleming proposal, I uh, met with uh, Mike Perry and Dave Nishwitz last week. They really were just seeking guidance on the field house and, and what uh, process needs to look like. And uh, I basically laid out to them the Fleming proposal is over $100,000. Uh, the, the architect contract will need to be with the school district. The building is going to be built on our property. And uh, so I told them basically the first step is to bring this to a board, the board for approval. Um, after that, uh, it, assuming the school board approved, we would need to hit, start having design meetings just like we did with Riverdale, just like we're doing now with the elementary school, and put the right people on that committee to make sure design decisions are being made. Uh, bring, go ahead and bring Fleming into the fold. Uh, all the while, they're out there chasing dollars and fundraising, trying to make this a reality. And they really need to go through this first step, which is on the proposal, in order to be able to do that. Um, the, the school board does need to be aware that you are at risk $22,500. Yeah, that, that's my question. What account are these funds going in? Who's making the payments? Are we liable for this? All good questions. <coughs> and then, so, I'm sorry. Go so ahead. I'll, go, I'll go through that. So the reality is, with this first step, we ha it is a district project. So. And we talked to them about that. They are they are the visionaries. They're the ones who say, here's a need for the district. They're the ones who are going out there working hard to get the funds for this project. But we're the ones who help manage this project with them. In order for them to do that step, they need to start getting into real numbers, real, real vision, because that's conceptual, the diagrams that you've seen in the past. They need to know what's going to fit on the property. And, and if that parcel of property isn't going to be the right fit, are we having to change the road? We need to go ahead and start doing that so that as they're going out, um, they can have real numbers with what they're asking for and so they can start saying okay it is really going to cost this much so that's this next step with this contract is now just like with the other projects we've had and we had this concern before when we mm -hmm. started uh, with the Riverdale expansion with the new elementary school we don't have the funding yet they don't have all the funding yet so how do we have those outs in the contract and so that's why you see the contract is built with certain stages that the owner which is the district has to say don't move on until we say move on to step two. So who actually is signing this is, is so the board. are we are signing? Yes, absolutely. Signing? Yes. The, the because it's going on district property. That yes. is absolutely right. correct. And at the but end does that make us liable? 
or were they only going to go to each step based on that they have based the funds on for us. each step? Yes, so that's yes. what I'm saying. So they have to have first step, we are liable if they don't raise any money. Uh, we okay. are exposed for twenty-two thousand now. Fleming is willing to work with them, and you know they have arrangements for this. But that's what we're exposed right now. So the next step, we would come before the board to say we're ready to move on to stage two and start doing the next step, which is what y'all just saw with the, the mm -hmm. new elementary school. And on there, they have like a part one A B one B that, that that's all included in the first scope of work for twenty-two thousand dollars. Okay, it is included in there because it said get additional bids on, but that is included in, that's in all, that. Okay, that's all. That's all. That's all included in that piece, and. Uh, in, in, a, in a perfect world, they go out, fundraise, everything goes wonderful, this happens, and uh, the district's not having any funds. But I do want to make you aware, approving this contract is basically giving them approval to go through step one what and, is, and then stop. For example, I mean, we've gone through this once before with the field, correct? Mm -hmm. Did we do something similar to no, it? Was way? A How that was, was a that? different process, and part of, that, How was that? part of that process was I wasn't comfortable with that process, okay. yeah. and nor should this board be comfortable okay. with the process. The reason being we were under such a tight constraint because of the lateral G coming, we were losing right. the deal. The foundation, which we also have seats on, I don't have to see, but we actually were liable for that. Yes. So if they, if make they the payments, for both liable. of them, if they defaulted on it, it would fall on to the district. Um, that one for me had less concern. So, so, so what's out there right now, we would have liability. Yes. Yeah, so, which is about six hundred thousand dollars, I think, for that foundation. Now they have. They're ahead of schedule and payment and what they're, they're right. doing, but know that it's, and this is unlikely, because yeah. half of the funds are paid through through our booster clubs. So, uh, for right. example, the football boosters, the right. band boosters, right. they're making regular payments to Yearly this. Payment well, let's say worst case scenario happened, and they came in and said, and everybody said, we're not paying for the rest of the turf field. We're done paying. The district, because it's on our property, one of two things could happen. The, the bank could come and say, okay, well, we're repossessing the whatever we can from the field and, and, and taking that. So um, but for I, that but, one, I wasn't as concerned I say, because- I'm not as concerned to some of you too because the different clubs are having uh, tournaments on there. They're raising additional money that's going back to yes. booster cups to help pay it off. And it's plus, offsetting. Plus we're oh, also sure, offsetting. Sure I, did, I, did, I, just, I, did not, I did not realize that there was a liability there yes. for us. I just thought it all stopped yes. with the- um, With the foundation. With the, yes no, no. Well, no, I thought it stopped, stopped with the person like who, was, who had signed the contract. I didn't know that the bank could look through that contract. Well, to us. essentially, yeah, they could. The property itself, the item itself, the carpet, they could take the carpet. Oh, okay. I, I didn't know that the, the collateral was yeah. put up. Would um, that be? Would it be possible for us to maybe have, um, maybe just an overview from the Arts and Athletics sure. Foundation, just to kind of show, kind of to your point, show us kind of the numbers of saying we're here, we're this yes. much ahead of schedule. Yes. This is the part that is a part of this, and that would kind of probably set up. The framework for what we would be doing going forward, as right. far as having as far but as having a report and, out. But this one's going to be structured differently. Um, now, Mr. Kathy played a huge role in the, the whole process, but they actually bid out that project for us um, because we're talking about the difference between an eight hundred thousand dollar project and a four million dollar mm -hmm. project. Um, and what's typical is this is going to be run through that. There were and there were some differences. We didn't need an architect for that job. Uh, we were putting turf down, and that was that was not something that well, required. Yeah, I, I was expertise. just curious because it was a, an, a foundation paying yes. for. You know, but but, but and we're liable. And what but what they want for this too is they do want to use the foundation as the funding body for this to be the five hundred one c three that accepts the donations and what they have, uh, and then that foundation would give us give us the money. Um, so know that anytime you have a building or a facility on your property, we would be liable for um, what's not paid for for this building. So what we're looking at here, here is kind unless of it's tier. structured with the lender. Yes, but it's unlikely that. But I'm just. I mean, yeah. I mean, if you know, if, I mean, it's all about what, how the contract is written, and if the That's lender right. can look towards and takes any collateral versus just the collateral or the, the written right. agreement from the the pledge. So my understanding is this is a tiered level. That we to a good extent have control over how Most quickly we move. We have based complete on, control over it. Based on what we how we how comfortable we feel with their fundraising. And yep. as of what we understand from their last presentation, they're at one point seven million. Is that correct? That's what they said, yes. But I don't think the money's been actually. Yeah, they don't have the money. Right, but that's, that's pledged, right. right. And, and I think they're looking at a five year structure for commitments. Um, okay. for payments for this. Um, so it is a quick um, 
really aggressive, Quick, aggressive. Uh, okay. time frame to do this. And when I laid out to them that yes, this is step one, the board has to be on, the board has to understand fully the risk that's involved with entering a contract because even though they're out there fundraising and it will go through the foundation, <coughs> as he said, we will be liable. This building's being built on our property just like we're liable for what we're sitting in right now, just like, I mean, we, it's, it's ours. We will manage the architect contract, we will manage the build, we will bid it out just like we did this and we're doing an elementary school. It will go through the exact same processes, including the approval processes uh, of the, the, the Board of Zoning and Appeals and the Planning Commission and the Design Review Commission. And when I started laying out those timelines, they started realizing we've got six months, seven months just of a, approval processes to get oh, through. Just for the city of Georgia. Just, just for and the that was city a hard, of And that was a hard, bitter pill for me to swallow, too, when we first started it. Because Shelby County never had to submit to all these <laughs> commissions. And we are the ones who have to go sit for each of these commissions. But for this contract, the we could walk away after the first phase if we needed to, so that so that when you sign something like this to yes. your point you can stop at each phase that's right and now, say we're it, done it will be a requirement in the contract to stop okay. at each phase okay. until they have received until they have, received, until they have received an ap approval to proceed to the next phase and mm -hmm. that will be all dependent upon the board being comfortable and that's with where we that's are in that process that oh no no, no. I, I, think, think I think that's a good control. control i think yeah. it's a I mean, to control. your point you don't know what you don't know so you've got to go through that first they, phase uh, we to understand. Take this step and we could help and this is something that I feel comfortable to that even within our budget that if the worst happened and uh, they weren't able to get this one we could handle this throughout of our uh, our operations budget that we already have budgeted right. so we could we can do that we could absorb that cost that but would not be they're caught in a similar position that we've been in the past and I empathize with them but right. the, the worst case scenario for you as a board is that you're putting twenty two thousand five hundred dollars at risk that we have co covered and budgeted currently right. that we could cover okay. but they don't they they need to go to the next phase before right. they can go through all of these things that they have to go through and they really can't without doing that. I, I, we've been there with the Riverdale sure. Project and we saw so I empathize with where they are right. right now. I'm trying to help them guide yeah. them through the process. Okay. Thank you. Um, so that is why this item is on the agenda. Are there any other questions about uh, the Fleming proposal? Well, so um, this isn't written to the district. What I, I mean, or have we gotten it revised? We will revise this. Uh, approving this, just like when you approve any any of these things, basically it authorizes the executive okay. committee. So then get to it to where you feel it. like it's okay. But I want to be very comparable to, to who is signing. Yeah, <laughs> it is very <laughs> comparable to this document that you're seeing right here. It just might change the name of who yes. it's going to and who's that was signing it. Type thing. Okay. Someone in the public just signing this. Yes, right. they're not. Thank no. you. This is our document. This is our right. document. Moving. The two of you would execute as okay. the executive committee, and there would be there would be provisions. And there will be a AIA. Well, AIA. I always get those letters mixed up. AIA one hundred uh, B one hundred one, which is our standard contract that we do with architecture firms, with defined language in there on stop and to yeah. be given a notice to proceed. I think okay. that's that's good. That's fair. Any other questions? But it's okay for us to approve that at the meeting, even though we don't have that language. Yes, in you're, here. you're approving okay. the executive committee to, to negotiate with that Perfect. Okay. Okay. That. okay. okay. With that dollar amount. Yes. Um, okay. I have one more question. question. Yeah. I was trying to. I just left me. Hold on. <laughs> Sorry. You said okay. So after this stage, or at this stage, this is at what point does do we have the design committees begin? So Let's what we have to do is once y'all approve this, we'll create a design committee working with Mr. Perry and the, the band boosters that you know, they've already played a role in this process. And really a lot of the same familiar faces that you've seen should serve on that committee because they are working so hard to, to push this through. And we'll start the same process. So we'll have our wish list of the things that we want in this building. Uh, we go to Fleming and they start looking at the land, they start doing surveys and they start looking at uh, how do we get what they want in the building? And so kind of come back with this kind of presentation yes. that we just yes. got on the new so you're school. Gonna, you're gonna, in addition to process. yeah, okay, okay, and, okay. and we can I'm, get an update on funding at that a, point as well. That a board member would be serving on that. Uh, we can definitely have a board member serving on that. The, I'll do it. Yeah, yeah. There, right. Right now, there's just a lot. Uh, everything you've seen is conceptual, which is uh, it, right. Pretty pictures, it's pretty. Um, but yeah, we have to get down into the, into the weeds of decision making, and, and the committee's the right right avenue through which to do that. But all we've got right now is a square footage estimate on what this thing costs until we start making decisions like what type of flooring is going down, what type of roof is going on, what type of HVAC system, and the other hundred decisions you have to make. Right. We don't know what this thing costs right. until we start getting through some of those decisions. And we've got a building; it probably fits. They've been out there, but we actually need to survey to see. 
just this big sure. footprint right underneath the home bleachers and where and so those are all things that we really need to get down into with that interior design committee and all of that has to happen before the, before we even begin going through uh, the commission the Germantown required for approval okay sounds good thank you any more questions from mr. Kathy on the field house okay next is update of the district master facilities plan just to give you a time mr. Kathy if you're looking at 55 minutes well, that's more than I needed but but I will uh, I will go through and hit, and hit uh, key areas and then if you have any questions uh, about any items at all please just stop me along along the way as we, we go have through a hard copy in there. there is no, a hard copy in here I've got the old one it's on the yeah, Ms. Crowder, do you want to protect it? Oh, she's going to show it. I think that's really loud. Yeah, yes, it is. <laughs> I wasn't going to go through and, and read every section, but I just wanted to get yes, I'm through, but I am going to go through just some key some key things to, to highlight or hit. Every year this has been updated. This is the fourth year that we've updated, and uh, the uh, the committee that did the work on this uh, we met two times. Ms. Parker was the board board uh, representative on the committee, and we also had uh, cabinet. Uh, we also had uh, Mindy and Terry Fisher's parents on the committee. Coach Leonard uh, from Houston High School was on the committee as well. Uh, Ms. Crowder has really uh, made this document look aesthetically. Uh, we've got updated pictures. We've got updated site plans and, and all of those things. But all of our cabinet, all of the folks on the committee had a hand in this. Academics has updated a lot of their information that relates to programs. And we really tried to focus on that, on how it might affect facility planning. Uh, the special education department had a hand in updating. Of course, Mr. Bland's department had a big uh, role in updating uh, student enrollment numbers. So every department had a, had a role and, and had a touch uh, with this. Technology has also updated theirs to reflect uh, what, what we've been doing on our one-to-one -one initiative and, and our technology initiative. So uh, a lot of work went into this committee meetings and uh, the, the document has been updated uh, as reflective and we're thankful for our committees, as always, uh, that, to give us good working documents like this. Um, I did want to uh, take your attention to page 8, um, which goes into historical enrollment. And these numbers have even changed since we've done this document. This was based on our first BEP counts for the year. Even since then, we've enrolled mm -hmm. and we've grown. Uh, but this, but this is a good, pretty good, accurate reflection of our of our growth. And if you look at uh, Table One, which is our historical resident enrollment, uh, we have grown 638 resident students since we have become a school district. So, if you build it, they will, will come. Has definitely held true. We are we have grown. Each year, each year we have, and I always like to kind of follow. Also summarize. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just to highlight, Table Three also highlights the differential between from year to year. So you can see how many students have increased, uh, and this will also be online uh, once the board has seen it. We will update the one that's online so all the community can see this too. The uh, I always like to look at those at Table One and. Uh, in, in diagonals because it kind of can help you follow a grade band to see how they've grown go, go, going across. So if you look at um, the first grade band, for example, in 2014-15, we had 350 first, uh, first, 357 first graders, and then it grew to 361, and then 369, and then to 393 residents where we currently are in that particular grade band. Uh, so our growth has been there. Uh, and Chat on page nine, as Mr. Manuel just pointed out, those are it's the same numbers, just a different just a different uh, presentation uh, on how we have grown in grade bands on pages five, six through eight, and nine through twelve. And I would like to highlight too one of the things we always talk about is growing up and down our residents and non-residents. And so that's a number that uh, Mr. Blaine controls through student services, and that's something we're going to control even more. I'm going to preach the same message over and over again about transfers, so hopefully no one's surprised, Mr. Blantz, so we don't get those calls. Um, notice what we have done, go back one, 
to the uh, in table two at the same time that we have our resident enrollment that's increasing we have also been controlling the non-residents that are attending our district and restricting those numbers as we are growing in the same now this year we experienced a large amount of resident growth at uh, Riverdale that we had not predicted it really jumped this year they had a, a big spike that we weren't ready for that's why we added teaching positions and when you get to the Riverdale side of things too, the teachers that we added are not counted in the teacher-student ratio. So know that that's going to have to be updated also. Be updated. Okay. So we'll do that with the new staff. So it's out of uh, out of whack. Out of whack. Mm -hmm. But know that we added mm -hmm. the new staff to get those grade bands in um, uh, compliant. Real quick question: We we kind of blew through the plan goals, which is no big deal. But I, there was one that was eliminated from the previous uh, facilities plan and. I was just curious what the committee's thoughts were on. What was the one that was eliminated? Allocate resources and invest in school facility improvements to support learning and instruction that is comparable to fee-based school environments. Um, yeah, I don't know why. I don't know if there was a big discussion on, um, I guess it was, do, are we keeping up with the private schools? Or are we offering uh, a similar? Do you remember? Mm -mm. I, d I didn't know if there had been like no, a specific, a specific conversation. But, it, but for me, I don't know if that should be one of our um, no, I, overarching goals. Is if if I was going to say something what we are like doing that, is. I wouldn't. I, yeah, it would have been different than let's keep up with the Joneses. Yes. It would be what what doing what is best for the yes. creating yes. facilities. And that I think that's why when we look at the other um, things that we talk say. about, is having 21st century facilities at all of our schools. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think all those things define it better than worrying about what someone else is uh, exactly. doing. Exactly. I, I didn't. I didn't have an issue with having that out. Right. I just wondered. Why I it wanted was out. why it was out, and and wanted to make sure that that somewhere in our goals we are saying school facilities need to be supporting environments. Now, yeah, I would I, say that's yeah. the. I would say that's the sixth bullet. One, two, three. Let me see. Or fifth One, bullet, two, three, upgrade four, existing five. school facilities to support innovative and advanced instructional technology infrastructure. Um, yeah, the, that's the, a that's, 21st century yeah. Um, schools. Yeah, I just get nervous about just it being technology when we're looking at, I mean, you're looking at STEM labs and you're looking at art rooms and you're looking at activity spaces. Mm -hmm. These are great, innovative thinking spaces. That but I'd love to see us eventually incorporate in a dogwood and a Farmington. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe you could put it into the last one says upgrade arts and athletic facilities. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to have something, you know, academics. academics piece yeah, to it, that maybe statement. add academics. Yeah. 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 Just to, it's, this is just a so suggestion. No, yes. I think that's fine. I think we'll that's add academics to that um, last bullet. I think that'd be an easy way to add that mm -hmm. in. That. It would be. And, and kind of on that theme, um, you know, one of the things when you look at all the great work that's been done I'd say probably over the last two years as you look at the site selection committee the new elementary school committee I mean just and just so many things where we've engaged and we, we have the experts and when I when I think about the facilities plan I almost think of it as a a um, should we have a committee that looks at this to say what should it be? You know, one of the things that I thought was great about how we came up with our new school was we came in with what is the wish list? What is it that we really need? Like if we could have it all in this design, this is what it would look like. Um, and then you come back and say, okay, well, that's great, but we have to cut back from that. But you don't let that cloud how you think about it. And so what I was wondering is, you know, when you think about a facilities plan and you're looking out kind of those five years, should you get a group around the table that have, you know, kind of the experts of, you know, looking at what what the what would what would Houston High School look like if we could have, you know, if we could really think out of the box beyond the box and say this is what we think this facility should look like, what would it look like and what would we have that the middle schools look like and what would we have our existing elementary schools and then come up with the prioritization of that of saying and, and I'm thinking of it as two different types of buckets because when you go through this, there's definitely things that we as a district have that come in through our budget. The maintenance, the deferred maintenance, it's kind of what I would say that money we get from Shelby County is. But then you have these big items, the Riverdale addition, the new school where we really have to go to our funding body and work with them and with the, and, or the field house with the community where if we really want our district to have this vision of that excellence always 
that that would kind of define where would do we need to engage the community? Where do we need to get the city? So that it's not just a one at a time, it's a this is our vision for 10 years from now, what we envision we would look like, prioritized, and we're kind of going on a, rep, on a roundabout. It's not a surprise every time, oh, we need this, or oh, we're gonna come to you again. It's a, we told you about it, and we're gonna come talk to you every year about kind of where we stand and what do we have the ability to do, and kind of gets the community engaged. And so I think what we have here is a great kind of where we stand and what we know is from a deferred maintenance perspective. What I was wondering is if we could take it a step further over this next year to take this committee and build it out to kind of similar, which I talked about needing for the field house where you have those experts that sit around the table, but make it more of a vision of what do we see our district looking well, like. I agree it needs to be a separate bucket because they are two different oh, things. Oh, completely agree. And, and I think that, that that is something we might want to look at because as Germantown Education Foundation mm -hmm. yes. um, mm -hmm. gathers funds, they will be looking for some uses for it. So I think that might be something down, you know, within the next year. Okay. We well, I spoke with that. an alderman today, and uh, and she just mentioned something about um, her contacts and wanting, what what would be the next big thing y'all would want to do that's not, not necessarily coming from the city, but she, with some of her contacts, she could say, hey, we're, we're looking at an auditorium in the next blah years, or, and I think having that kind of, like Linda said, having that kind of separate bucket list vision would give not only us the ability to go in those meetings and say, these are, these are our wish lists. If you want to write us a check or want to write this foundation a mm -hmm. check and tag mm -hmm. it for the auditorium, you know, that kind of well, thing. Well, the last page of this mm -hmm. is our wish list. Well, 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 but I, I, but I would almost, together. yeah, I would say it's one, it's, it's kind of together, but I would also say that it could be bigger than this. I mean, you know, one of the things that, well, it could you know, be bigger than this, but we got $11 million deferred maintenance right now. And I, and I'm not disagreeing, but what I'm, what I'm saying is that if we go beyond the box, we have this deferred maintenance and I would almost say and that's it, not the sexy and stuff. And to your point, that's, that's a great, it's a great concept and it, it's an election year concept <laughs> more, more likely, but right now we're just trying to get through this. Yeah. This. No, 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 and I'm, I'm not, what I'm saying is that what I'd love to do is not have it stop here, not say that this is it, but kind oh, of not. take that, really say for 2018, we'd like to kind of, as we get ready to go into that next budget, you know, about this time next year, we look at what would be that vision. It because, is a great, it's a great concept. Because what I would say is money flows when you can show somebody what you want and what they what their money could buy i think the 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 bill folds will open up and and i think we're right at the cusp of that and i think we're seeing that with the energy around the field house the excitement with you know the reason riverdale went up i'm sure a big part of it is we're sitting there i mean you see this greatness we have the new elementary school that's coming in i just think people are good that an energy and we just want to capitalize well, let, on let's, it let's agree that that's a separate bucket and something we want to discuss in the future and let's let's just well, focus well on this. but a committee set up to come up with that not just i mean I, I think it's more than just one person or more than i mean i think when you look at the great work that comes out of this what i would like to do is agree that maybe we set up kind of that facilities vision committee to say where could we engage and who could we pull into that to really look at each of our facilities um, and it's not a quick and dirty I mean you're not going to be done in a month I mean there's a lot of other stuff obviously that's going on but if we could have a goal that this time next year we could look at something like that from a committee I think that'd be a great step I think the challenge is going to be the numbers of people that we have involved and it may have to be towards a specific purpose because we do have a facilities committee that does have uh, people from the community that are on it. Mr. Leonard is uh, serving mm -hmm. as one of those. I think the challenge for us is going to be timing around the athletic facility. Uh, we are optimistic that the city is going to work with us with the land behind um, Houston High School. And so I think, uh, to your point, I think what we would have is a separate uh, group that is going to look at what is that whole athletic complex look like behind Houston High School. That is going to be vision work that talks about, um, like I can tell you right now, we talked about the need for additional gym space and I came close to getting it uh, at Houston High School previously but didn't get the funding for it. Uh, we have designs for that building all the way through uh, we almost designs construction. To change the really through construction. that we did the first year. Well, no, well, and, well that's, what, that's what I'm saying is yes. like not just even saying it just to the back part, but the whole Houston High School complex, what would it look like? We'd like to have a gym, where would it go? We'd like to have an auditorium, where would it go? 
do we want our cafeteria to be bigger? Well, how would you do that? I'm just throwing this out. I don't even know if that's a thing. But, but to really look at that, and I hear you, maybe it is too much to take on the entire. So maybe to your point, if we're looking at potentially getting those fields in the back, we say let's focus on the high school first. Let's see what could we do and what would that plan look like and what would that committee, and I think the one thing, and y'all correct me where I'm wrong here, but when I looked at the committee makeup, the one thing that I think is different about the other committees that have been like the, the design and the site selection is we actually had experts from, you know, like architects or des, um, design firms. I mean, we, we to get people in there that can kind of bring out um, the creative process through it. Well, let's go ahead and finish this discussion and we will put on, put that idea with Mr. Kathy and uh, the superintendent to follow up on. I think okay. we can definitely yeah. follow up on that. Yeah. I think that would be great. Thank you. Okay, so where were we? Um, we were looking at numbers. I'm sorry, I had page nine. Page nine. Thank you. The throttling up and down. Yes. Okay, so yeah, back to, let's see. And page nine again, that's just repackaging of similar or the same numbers, right. um, but it just shows the growth that has taken place. Uh, page 10 is again, it just breaks it down on an individual school level mm -hmm. uh, so that you can see how many residents or non residents are, are at each school currently. The, we did include information, of course not the whole report because the demographer's report that we had done is about as big as this report, but we did add to this, which is new from the past, uh, on page 12 and on page 13, uh, some information from our demographer's report that just kind of shows growth and projections of growth over the next uh, nine to ten years. We did also update page 14 to show some, give some additional language um, because we're assuming that the public is going to be reading this document and we didn't have uh, a whole lot of language in there about maximum capacities and what the state allows. So we added language there. Um, we updated a few of the numbers because we had some preschool shift around and we had some classrooms move, but for the most part these, these remain pretty constant other than a little bit of shifting of classroom usage on page 14, so your, your max capacity, your optimal capacity numbers there on chart 5 at the bottom are your school enrollment and capacity utilization that shows you how many we can hold and how many we currently have in the buildings. Uh, page 15 through 18 was up, and a lot of these have been updated as well, our, our program descriptions, and mm -hmm. again we tried to focus these specifically on things that would require facility modifications or facility needs. So you have STEM uh, labs that would, that, would, that would be something that the academics department identified as would be a very nice thing to do that require facility modifications. Uh, we have fine arts listed and we'll get to that at the end. Um, I was trying to put together the conversation the board was having and I think what I was hearing is yes when we identify big needs we need to do committee work. Uh, there have been a lot of people talking about, hey, for the arts, the auditorium is a priority, right. Houston High School Auditorium, and that absolutely should be a, a group of experts that know about stage lighting and sound lighting and sound, a sound engineer, maybe even the auditorium that can look absolutely. at sound Absolutely. Well, and we've had but GPAC, to that, GPAC uh, involved, too. And that's what I'm trying to get really to. We may, have to. we may have to have offshoots of this big facilities committee because the people who are helping design the auditorium and theater won't be helpful or as helpful with this designing the ball fields behind. Oh, no, 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 and, and, I, and I completely agree with that. I think when you get down to that level, what I'm thinking about, not to this level, like this level is where you're right, it's an auditorium. Right. But I was thinking of that first picture, you know how when y'all first came to us the very first time and said this could be kind of a picture of what we could do. Right. You don't hold us to it. Right. But I'm thinking of having that be first the committee work of this, the overview. Then to your point, when you prioritize them and we say auditorium's number one, that's the one we're going to go after first, that's when it completely gotcha. shuffles off and then you have an auditorium specific committee that gets into this level of detail that's the second level is what I would envision because you're absolutely right. That's a whole. It's just a projection to the future so that people who have elementary students now look, can look at this potential layout and say, oh, by the time my child's in high school, they may have a re renovated auditorium and those awesome ball fields in the back. 
Well, you know, it's, to me, that, that sells the school. And from a promotion perspective, we've got a big new fancy high school coming up near us. And I think if we can show what our own is going to look like, I think that's a very powerful statement the um, potential. to the community. The, the potential. potential. The, not what it's going to look well, like. But, but if, we ha if we could get our community engaged and get work, you know, this is what we would see it could be. This is what we could achieve. I mean, this would be the priority we would go in. So I just think it could be a win-win. But yeah, okay. yeah, ma'am. Uh, going through uh, the next step after programs, we show on page 19 partnerships that exist, and these are certainly not an all-inclusive list, right. but ones that we've chosen to highlight with the city of Germantown and the partnerships that exist mm -hmm. there through the uh, Breach Program, Parks and Rec, and our SROs, SROs at our schools that are like part of the family school that we have. Um, um, I have a question on the Parks and Rec. When we are yeah. looking at the basketball practices and such. When we're, when we're doing that, and I, you, you said something uh, at the last, one of the other meetings about how if they're a club sport or they're not a sponsored sport, they go through the same process to get gym space. Is that, I mean, does, you know, if, we're, if we to have... To rent facilities. Now, with the city of Germantown, it's different because okay. we treat them as a, almost internally uh, because, so we allow them, they have their liability, they have their process. I so it would be an outside, an outside group that does that. So I see what you're any saying. of the city activities or sports like GBL or right. GF that want to use our facilities, they're treated differently than. I got that's okay. That's what that's what I was saying. That okay. makes sense. So like if Lobo Soccer, for example, wanted right. to come in and rent the soccer field, they'd have to go through the rental process with Mr. Cat. Okay. Okay. Thank you. But if um, Germantown Soccer League wanted to, it could stream, it streamlined. Okay. Yeah, and Thank that's you. a barter agreement. It's actually a contract that we have with the city. We, we allow them use of our facilities in exchange. Okay. They mow and edge our, uh, all of our campuses. Sounds fair. Mm -hmm. yes. Very nice. After that in the document is each individual school page. Um, and it just gives, again, some highlights of each school. It gives you good historical information on how many acres each school sits on, how many square feet are at each school. Uh, and some, some descriptive language about capital projects that have been completed um, in our first three years as a district before we head into year four. Uh, highlight some of the good things that we've done there. Uh, and we have updated site plans. Mr. Manuel did like the architectural uh, architectural looking site plans that are more that are more for technical. So these are these, yeah. these are these are uh, better for Aerial, the document. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like it. Unless there's any questions on, the, on any of the school, schools, I'm going to head down past those. Each one of those, again, on the chart shows resident, non-resident, how many teachers, uh, student to teacher ratio. And then past that on page 33 is uh, enrollment priorities. And this is really where we talk about addressing uh, how we're going to deal with growth. So. One of the things, of course, we put on here that's updated is the constructing the new elementary school. We talk about where we are in that process, purchase the land, going through the approval processes, um, updated numbers and things of that nature for the elementary school. And then the second one that we talk about is accommodating middle school growth. I think Mr. Manuel wants to talk a little yeah, bit more about that on nervous. page. That's page 34. 34. Mm -hmm. And it was mentioned earlier, I think, during A2H's yeah. presentation as well. And so, and really it's just a, recap of what we've already talked mm -hmm. about is that we see this as being um, a challenge for the district and we, and we won't know how much of a challenge until we look at our enrollment numbers last year but first step for us is to dramatically cut uh, the transfers here at, at our schools uh, so that will that should help and, and create some some room for us at our schools how quickly do you need us to address that um, I don't think it requires um, a board vote specifically it is some I'm, I'm just trying to be public and say just it's so coming. you know it's okay. coming so that when you get the email so from no someone change of policy there's either. no change of policy okay. because we have our priorities listed, listed out right and we just look at the capacity of the school as we go down those priorities so you're and just we're, communicating that we're I'm at capacity we have this order but we're right there you yes okay uh, and so know that, okay. that we're gonna hit that and so um, okay. and so in theory it would take three years at the middle school level for that to it would take push well, you, out. I mean, you, you, you gradually, get, little, a third, a third, a third, almost, yes, when you look at the numbers. Yes, okay. so three years to have the full effect, but know that we looked at our roll-up of our current students who are on transfers at Dogwood and Farmington, for example, rolling up to um, Houston Middle School, 
and if we cut those transfers, so those students who are currently attending on transfer, except for employees, right. children, I always put that out there, um, that that would have a dramatic impact uh, on the, the students in the school. Okay. And so. Well, and, and I think that that's one of the, um, when I was looking at the numbers, it, we have, and these numbers change, so I could have a yes. bad number, but about 50 of those non-residents are employee children. You know, when that's you right. look at the total of Riverdale and Houston Middle together, um, so when you look at our um, over capacity of about 120 <clears throat> and you back out those because you would think those would stay because that would right. be something that's and a benefit. No, yes, and know too that the over capacity number of being over by 120 students was based on the demographer's projection of 2024-2025. That was their peak of when we hit that. When and I, so we're I, I was that. No, I was talking now. Like oh, when yes. we look at, yes, the, it, it includes the residents, the right. non-residents. So we're about 120-ish. Yes. I think 123, but, but, but 120-ish. And so if you think about your over, but then when you back out the non-residents of 214, you would think you have quite a bit of room. That's correct. But you have to add 50 of those back in because they're employees' children, and you're not going to, those will stay as a benefit. Yes. So you're really only looking at about a 40 right now today um, under of that optimal capacity. And that number, in, for me, makes me a little nervous when you're talking about um, how f how fast we're growing, mm -hmm. um, and when you look at that trajectory, um, that that could be. I mean, and even when you look at his numbers, I mean, you you, you take at least half of that, if not a, um, two thirds of it, the so next it, one. So it could. So if we experience uh, tremendous growth, like we've said in the past, one of the things that we would have to address is putting on additional gym space at Houston Middle School, along with an additional wing. Uh, maybe eight classes would accommodate the, the worst case if we can't accommodate it through transfer but know that those are all on the table that's why we list that as um, and, and when would we programs. have that dialogue I mean like because it would take a year or two to get that I mean I'm assuming for the addition like it to say we want an addition to do the to your point it takes six months just to get that's right <laughs> through a planning process to be able to break ground I mean how I and mean, what is our lead time of having to have that conversation well, when is you know the peak is, well, is, well, I mean, is, down well, the, is a little is it, it a few is years down the road. So a think. few years could be, we need to have it in a few years versus having the conversation when we're at the peak. I mean, that's what I'm just trying to get ahead of it. Is that if we think right now we've only got a cushion of about 40. Yeah. So this this would be something. Well, not a cushion yeah. of about. We can add um, 120 <laughs> students capacity over a three-year period here. That's without the zoning. I'm um, sorry. One more time. We can add 120 students. So if you're talking about 40 per grade band over the next three years, so if I'm denying the people who are on transfer at Dog Oh, no, absolutely. Yeah, I got, I got the 120. Absolutely. Yeah, so 120 over a three-year period. That doesn't take into account what we're doing here at Riverdale School. So at Riverdale, for example, same thing's happening if I'm restricting those transfers and I look at moving my boundary to absorb some more students from Houston Middle School, that's also going to add to that 120 student number. Um, so there is flexibility there. So for us, what we're talking about is we will have better numbers uh, this uh, spring once we have looked at that restriction of transfers and then also who's who's coming and we'll get our next glimpse of, of growth. I would say at, um, by May, we will, this late into the school year, we would have to have, start having real conversations about is this going to, um, what's going to be the impact. And then I would say by the next school year, August, um, that's probably going to be our real decision-making point. We'll see that next group of growth that have just moved into the city, and so that's when, at that point, we have to say, okay, let's. It's time to go through the design process. It's time to, or are we going to be able to accommodate it through rezoning. the rezoning and the transfers? And so, how does that come into a conversation with whether we do a district office or not? So, for example, worst case scenario is we say yes, we can afford a district office today, but then coming August of 2018, it looks like we might need a um, we need I would an say addition. It's not related and we don't at all. We are paying $155,000 a year for central office space. My proposal to the city is I want to change from the leasing central office space over to buying central office space and having a mortgage. And so what I, what I want to do is not do anything that's going to have dramatic impacts on 
that. I think also the request for us. So not from us, the reserves yeah. per se, yes. is from an operating. From an operating. I got, okay. So that's, yeah, that's they, my okay. objective they now. I see what, okay, so there are two, two different, different files. Yes. So that, that's my goal. Now, how they work out the funding mechanism for that, and is there going to have to be a situation where we do have to, now this would be your question, do we have to tap reserve? Right. right. Or do so we have to right. get this project off the ground? Um, I don't think that's going to have an impact on the middle school. What we have to get out of the mindset of, and the reason I say this is, we can't keep funding building projects out of our reserve. No, we can't. we can't keep paying for buildings out of our operating and what we're doing. I so Absolutely. I think the goal for us, so if we had to use reserve to get this central office started to get the funding mechanism, um, the reality is, however it works out with the funding, you know, we have to put know, money, yeah. we may have to put some money that's down right, that's right, that's right. to get it started building. Then we look at switching that 155,000 over to rebuilding like whatever we had to take down. over that reserve and what we had to do. Okay. Um, what was the population at its highest at Houston Middle? Um, they got well over where they are right now. So they were up to, uh, I would say 1,200 students at one point. Now they had floating teachers. Um, we haven't had that yet. Um, so we can accommodate a lot more students at Houston, you know, but it's Houston not, High School. But, but it's that's not, not optimal. It's well, not and, optimal. And I don't know that that's what our district is about. I mean, to your right. point, you know, when you talk about changing the mindset of you know, how we're looking at how we fund these, which I think is where this vision document could start putting the, the saying, we're not, a, we're not a revenue generating body. That's right. We're dependent on money from our funding body as well as the community, whether it's through taxes or however, we're not, we don't generate revenue. So I think, but I think also at that same time, our community has certain expectations and it's not putting 1,200 students in Houston Middle, it's actually saying, let's think ahead and let's have this type of facility, right? not this type, but I mean, where you can house and you have plenty of room, that we need to think think about that and not wait until we're crammed or have to add a portable type thing. And but, I think, but I with, think, with, but I think we've got to be careful though with, I'm with, sorry. With eliminating some of those in the next year, it's going to give us time to make a that plan. No, 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 that's what I'm saying. I, I completely agree. I have no issue with that timing. I think that's right. a very, I think it's very reasonable. I had not put two and two together about the central office, and that's what my concern was, is that would we be making a decision today that would impact us making a decision in no, August? And no, so, and it sounds like those us, are completely for, two for different things, so that's... I'm saying it no, I don't, perfect, want, makes perfect I don't sense. want to pay for middle school capacity out of our reserve. That shouldn't be the right. No, I agree. Sport. Absolutely. I agree. Um, central office, I feel, is a little bit different because we are paying for that out That's of our right. operating Already. budget right now mm -hmm. with that $155,000 payment. I'll say that over and over again. Um, so for me, it's no, that makes perfect sense. I think that point, and that's why we've had those conversations with the city, and when we met with them when we were talking about elementary, um, they were able to fund through their funding, they were able to give right. us $27 million for this building. I would have taken the middle school right then and there, but do, is that what we needed right at this moment and can we deal with that growth? I think the challenge for us to, I'm not 100% opposed to modulars anymore. I don't want to do modulars, but I think for short term uh, handling growth, it hasn't been bad at Dogwood and, and Farmington. Those are actually... I, you know, I, 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 I think the students haven't necessarily been I yes. mean, it, but it's I not the solution I want to go that's to. That's right, and so and what I would like to do is have us not have to go through there because that's you know that's hundreds of thousands of that's dollars right. that you don't have to spend that you could be putting into a building. That's correct. That if we can get ahead of it, and and I I could imagine a great time of us having a room that we might not know what to do with. That we might actually be able to have a science room that's right. separate and that's not a classroom in a middle school, which would be a great, which we haven't experienced that in a while. Right. Um, and I think if we could have that as a vision to get there, um, I don't think that would be necessarily a bad thing. So, yeah, so to get back to where we're at, so yes. to re I don't think we should be thinking central office as compared to middle school. Expansion. And I don't want our buckets. community to think that either. Right. Because really is, we take care of the children first. Yes. Um, and we take care of those spaces first. But unless we do something for central office, not that we're throwing money away, it doesn't fit our needs. It's on the very edge of uh, what we need, uh, that should be a priority. And, and I think also. I think making that distinction to your point is very important because I yes. think that we don't we you know I think it's very good. Thank you for talking me mm -hmm. through that. Sure. Okay. Next is um, when we get down into our facility assessment and just a little bit of a reminder of of history. Uh, when we started uh, the district, one of the things we did in our first year was uh, we, empo we uh, employed Fleming Architects to do a, an analysis of our existing facilities, 
Uh, they did a good job of that and identified some of the priorities that we've already knocked out, some still remaining from their list. Uh, that, that analysis that they did uh, is a large portion of the projects that you see on the last right. page when we mm -hmm. get there. Mm -hmm. uh, we have done some projects that were not identified by Fleming that the district identified as priorities or when we looked at our work order list we identified as an administration of priorities. Uh, repaving Houston High School would be an example of that uh, where the potholes had gotten that bad and the condition was just that bad for reason that administration recommended that to the board to tackle. But a large part of the projects that you see are from that facility analysis uh, that we did at the beginning of the district. Um, we have trimmed our deferred maintenance list. When we began as a district, we were just over $23 million in deferred maintenance. And we have trimmed that down to uh, a much more manageable number. Still a ways to go, but it's just over $11 million and we're just gonna keep hacking away at it until we, till we get there. And we in the operations department do, do what we can with the funding that we have to complete as many projects as possible in the time frame that we get during the summer. So. Um, I say very good thoughts about the boilers every day, just to make sure, <laughs> keep on yes. going, keep well, on going. We keep that, we carry that one yeah, on the list yeah. every year and, and hope that, that old Bessie keeps chugging right. forever, <laughs> but uh, you just, It'll, we need to have it on the board, list, so if we right. have an emergency, that's we right. can come to the board and say, we've got a full-blown emergency here, we need, to, we need to take care of this now. Mm -hmm. um, one question on page 35 where it talks about the facilities audit, is that some, I mean, is that just something that you do through your, I mean, um, where was it? Page 35. Okay. Um, it says on an annual basis. Yes, that's, that main, that's mainly our department. Okay, that's just what you go through and just assess if there's something that needs. And they're if it's looking a, at the work order system to see. Okay. What's, for, what's a problem? Okay. Okay. Correct. Uh, but the, so we do that. And we also have a, a piece in our budget process that plays into it where the principals submit what their wants and needs are, the board submits I do remember what their that. wants mm -hmm. and needs are. Mm -hmm. and so we take all of that plus the Fleming study plus our own work order system and combine all that data and, and really try, try to take a look and prioritize. Okay. Thank you. Um, let's see. The only other page that I was really planning on highlighting uh, was the last one. Uh, and that is the, that's the list of projects. Uh, and I think to y'all's point earlier, the Houston High Athletic Complex and FY19 and the auditorium renovation are to be determined. Uh, one, of the, one of the things I think we've done in the past is let a number get out there too fast. We always try to learn from our mistakes, and I think that was one that we have made mm -hmm. on, on uh, some things where a number gets out and everybody grabs that number. So we don't want to throw a number out until we've had those committee meetings. We've sat mm -hmm. down, we've planned, we've looked at cost estimates, and we say, okay, now we know the Houston High Auditorium is going to co cost roughly X. Right, that makes perfect um, sense. And the athletic complex is to be determined because we need to have those similar meetings, but also if we do end up getting the park space, and that's not a def definite, but it's a possibility, that's a game-changing conversation that could take, take it in a totally different direction. Oh, so yeah. We didn't feel comfortable putting numbers in this document because we don't have the vision yet. And Ms. Yeah. Crowder, can you go to the top so they can see the green and yellow? I would like to highlight the green and yellow, just why we have those highlighted. If you remember, green has been fully approved by this board except right. for the final right. steps for the new elementary school, and that's when you all approve the bid process where we actually go out to contract and you all approve it. The yellow ones were tentative projects that, um, so for central office, you'd approve us a step to go through the architects and put it out to bid with the new um, <coughs> elementary right. school to mm -hmm. see cost savings that we mm -hmm. could add for that school. That is gonna require the board another vote for them to do that. Uh, the field house, y'all had voted that it was a priority for us. Uh, tonight, you'll take the next step for us uh, to start changing that color to, to green. Um, if, if y'all do that, because we start going through the architect process with right. it, so know that the, that's why those are highlighted. The others, um, Mr. Kathy just has to look at the funding that we get from the county commission uh, and to I, determine. And I would like to stress this as well. This is a document that we take to our funding bodies. We only have two. We've got the city of Germantown and we've got the Shelby County Commission. And every year we take this and we present it to them and say, here are our needs. Um, and it, do we have enough to fund everything on this list? No, we don't, right. not in our general fund budget or the dollars that we get from the Chevy County Commission. Um, but structuring it this way, uh, dog, the city of Germantown came to the table and said, yes, we recognize this is a need that happens now, and they funded us a million dollars for Dogwood mm -hmm. Roof. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've always, 
thought of this document as something where it's our job to present the need uh, and then from there our funding bodies do what they will with that need but that that's part of this I think that's what I was hearing earlier is we need to make sure it presents the need that's what that's what we're doing as far as our demur deferred maintenance list and we want to make sure it presents the need going forward some of those things that you guys were talking about earlier with committee work right honestly because when I was looking at the page before like 38 where you had the different priorities which I really like that page um, of how you how you prioritize which of those well that was the original committee that set this right when we first had the committee together the very first committee looked at this and said here's how we need to prioritize tackling these things um, but one of those almost as we were talking is maybe that fourth one that where it's the big like re-engage the community you know just kind of thinking from it to your point about some of um, breaking this out um, about needs versus the vision of it would be great an enhancement what I would call it versus the need of our boilers out and we need to heat our school right, that's, um, one. that's right that's right versus it's an enhancement that could really improve the promotion of our district right. and really enhance the the experience but it's not necessarily a need and I think uh, that's what want. the yeah. priority three I think that's what the original committee was aiming for oh okay it was three years ago but I'm, if I'm remembering back uh, priority one was what you said boilers right yeah. school can't function with leaking roofs HVAC units priority two was somewhere in the middle that uh, non-critical but still got to be done but I think that was what pro they were aiming for priority three was deferable and desirable bring a facility up to the district standards yeah right uh, and improve the quality and convenience but it, there could be that's more added, point, there right? could be a whole lot more added to that to make sure we're saying what is that this is no, that's good just going forward yeah um the, just the one thing that I noticed this the FY18 <clears throat> taking out the big things, taking out the green and the yellow. Um, you're looking at 4.25, um, and, and I look at the following years, and it's usually in the two and a half range. Um, is there a reason that we've got two million more? I mean, is there some, because I mean, I'm we, seeing the LED lighting. We moved, lighting. Them, we yeah, moved I think that got moved up. 16 17 now they're in 18 right and it's because of the boilers and because of the Houston high uh, boiler water heater replacement we have moved those because they're still working but when right. they go it's they're going to be needed it's going to be needed right okay. so something like the LED lighting upgrade in all schools We're which is a million to, dollars uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Uh, I would I mean I, I think I, I love awesome. them here, I mean, so I'm, I know what you're. We're both we're, gonna say we're, the same. We're hoping we're to working, get a very, grant very to do on that a, on a grant or a funding right. mechanism, or that's a cost neutral. Outstanding. Uh, there are a lot of performance contractors that will uh, that will come in and do that project and guarantee you a certain savings on your utilities, which you will get. And so it, that that's the only project on that list that has an ROI, return on investment, when it's done. And the ROI is, is <coughs> pretty quick in years. Okay. Uh, but it would be a huge upgrade to our lot to the quality of the lighting in our facilities. Absolutely. And every every month that we don't do that, we're paying it into our utility bills. So I've been working with Mr. Jones on trying because, you, as you guys know, we're not a revenue body, which That's means right. we cannot take on debt. So That's we, right. We were, we are working our, our best to try to find a funding mechanism for that that makes it cost neutral to the budget. That would be great. Um, but one last, what is the um, four hundred thousand for modular in fiscal year nineteen? So we always plan that what's going to happen if our elementary schools keep growing, if we keep moving, that that, that would be an addition. And so we've got the site prep that goes into that, but we also have the lease of additional units for it too. So, so it's a just in case. A just in, so just, a, just in case. So that's we, one thing that, yes. not if all done. heck broke loose. Yeah. All heck breaks loose. Okay. Yeah, okay. That's not a plan. It's I, like I, a boiler. I hope, okay. we I hope we don't do it in FY19. Uh, I hope we don't have yeah. to do it in FY18. Right. Either. I'm hopeful that we can accommodate what we have with our right. current until modulars the until the new school. Exactly. Opens. Okay. But that's, um, just, that's a placeholder in case it, is, it does end up helps. being a need. And then the last was, did bathrooms come up in the facilities yeah. conversation? <laughs> yeah, it is something that we want to do, but it doesn't fit the budget item as far as we're looking at things that are over, what, 100000 or a large number. It could be very expensive, but as far as individual bathrooms, we think that's something that we want to tackle out of Mr. Cathy's general fund. General fund okay, so it's on a list have. somewhere. But yeah. it just wasn't big we enough to meet this smaller list. Smaller projects. Got it. Okay. So we, can okay. we can do bathrooms at a time. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so upgrade. just not big enough to hit this list. Yes. Okay. Okay. Good to know. Thank bathrooms you. Bathrooms where? 
Just and make all them the schools, prettier, maybe doing an ADA schools, stall, but, yeah. but they're not very pretty. They, I, I, sorry, and let maybe, me say it more professionally. Yes. When, when, when stakeholders come into yes. our, to our schools and they see those For the tournaments that does not and make for a great the, impression. yes, that's right. That's right. Well, Versus I, I'm here, elementary schools. I mean, you're in they're, heaven. Yes. You think it's fabulous. They're 40 year old bathrooms in elementary yeah. schools. Yes. Yeah. Well, the committee tried to do um, the best they could in prioritizing after the the green and the yellow, <laughs> then we put the uh, Farmington um, HVAC unit replacement. Mm -hmm. Houston High Painting, of course you know the Shelby County funds cannot pay for painting. Um, Farmington ceiling tile grid replacement after they painted, uh, what's left is the, the yellow tiles need to be replaced. Right. Uh, Dogwood ADA upgrades, uh, that's been on the list for a couple of years. Yes. Uh, the LED lighting, the Houston boiler, the modular classrooms, and the Riverdale boiler. Mm -hmm. So it is up to us. How much money do we get to spend? <laughs> <laughs> so, TBD? <laughs> yes. Yeah. And that's one thing that you'll see that Mr. Cathy always does with his budget. That's why we're talking mm -hmm. about the financial side mm -hmm. of it. He will not spend uh, his, his capital budget till the end of the year based on just waiting to see if a boiler sure. goes out or something right. like that. That's usually you know, why he does his projects late. That's also why he has such a fun summer. Yeah, well, we will handle small projects like the library remodels that we did at Houston Middle and at Dogwood right. uh, and at uh, the guidance, and, office, and, and the guidance office. Those are small general fund budget items that we handle capital throughout the school year. But yes, 80, 90 percent of my budget is spent in, in May, June, July, and August. Mm -hmm. Well, we can individually prioritize what we would like to have done and then let Mr. Kathy know. And now for us to the priority list that we have there and the reason they're listed in that sequence is it really is what will shut down school quickest. Oh, sure. So if you notice yeah. like the HVAC or the next one's on there because we don't have heat or yeah. air, that's one that starts. I mean, y'all are the, the experts on that in my opinion. I mean, as far as that yeah, goes, I, I don't have a, I mean, yeah. between you and the administration at the schools, I mean, y'all know best what priority that needs to go in. Looks good. Yeah. Any other questions for Mr. Kathy? Thank you for your work. Thank you, Mr. Kathy. We know you have a play in the committee. It was, a, it was a group effort for sure. Everybody, everybody was on the committee and the whole cabinet. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. We'll take a like a seven-minute break.